honored to have you with us today. And of course, a very warm welcome to our distinguished speakers. We are so happy that you could all be with us. Japan has always been a country of great significance for us at the Ananta Center. Our work with Japan has gone from strength to strength. We started focusing on this relationship way back in 2006 with our trilateral dialogue with USA, Japan, and India. The Japan-India strategic dialogue was born out of the meaningful conversations and deep relationships formed in this trilateral. Since 2017, we have added visits of Indian parliamentary delegations to Japan to our portfolio. We have also established a forum for young leaders from India and Japan to explore more innovative areas of collaboration between our two countries. A series of public sessions titled India-Japan Partnership Perspectives are held regularly for enriching the discourse on this crucial relationship. Our biggest endeavor towards this relationship has been the inaugural India-Japan Forum held last year. The forum was co-chaired by Mr. Harshvardhan Shringla, Foreign Secretary, and Mr. N.K. Singh, our chair for the day. We were honored to have foreign ministers of Japan and India, Mr. Toshimitsu Motegi and Dr. S. J. Shankar address the gathering. Let me now introduce to you the chair of this conference, Mr. N. K. Singh, Chairman 15th Finance Commission, Government of India, and Trustee Ananta Aspen Center. Mr. Singh has always been a strong advocate for robust India-Japan relations, and his contribution towards strengthening these ties has been invaluable. He has been a recipient of the Order of the Rising Sun, Gold and Silver in 2016, Japan's second highest civilian award. Thank you, Mr. Singh, for truly being a pillar of support for our work on Japan. May I now request you to kindly take over the proceedings and address the gathering. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Kiran. Uh, that is a very uh, strong message to this uh, important session, which I'm privileged to chair. And good morning to all of you. Good afternoon to my friends in Japan. And of course, good night, perhaps, to Sugato, who has joined at a very unusual hour from, from the United States. A warm welcome to all of you on this special conference, uh, India and Japan, 70 years of cooperation and the way forward. This is indeed a very significant year for both India and Japan as you mark the 70th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations. In relation to Japan, I cannot but become nostalgic of a country which I deeply love and admire. I was privileged to live there and serve there for five years. And the endearing warmth and affection which I received and continue to receive is an indelible part of my consciousness. Both our countries have shared a close and deep partnership over the last several decades. The bilateral relationship which has grown on a bedrock of strategic interest, has encompassed business, culture, and people-to-people -people contacts. India and Japan have become close to the idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific. During the pandemic, the two countries have worked in close concert to build a resilient supply chain to battle against the COVID. Within the Quad, we are together in promoting diverse goals, including a rules-based order, maritime security, which was referred, vaccine equity, and critical technologies, among others. We share an abiding commitment to peace and stability, to the international rule of law, and open global trade regimes. Our economies have vast, and if I may add, untapped complementarities that have boundless opportunities for mutually beneficial 
economic partnership. Japan has been one of India's most important trading partners globally and internationally. This strategic and special relationship and global partnership has been reinforced in recent years by increasing engagements in the area of defense, investment, trade, energy, and technology. This relationship has observed intense engagement despite the challenges of the pandemic. And today's meeting is one classic example with the promise of elevating the relationships even to greater heights. As we reach this key milestone of 70 years of partnership, it is indeed an opportunity for us to assess how far we have come, what new potential exists untapped, and to conceptualize new roles which we can together play in ushering the prosperity of our two countries for the region as a whole and to act as an important engine of global stability and peace. Over the next few hours, we will have the honor of hearing from Mr. Taro Honda, the Parliamentary Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Government of Japan, and Mr. Harsh Vardhan Shingla, the Foreign Secretary of India. I'd like to welcome our two ambassadors, Ambassador Sanjay Varma, Ambassador of India to Japan, and of course, much nearer uh, to where I live now, uh, to Ambassador Suzuki, the Ambassador of Japan to India. It's a pleasure to have both of you join on this important occasion. It's now my great pleasure and honor to share with you a personal message from Mr. Taro Honda, Parliamentary Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Government of Japan, who has very kindly shared a video address for this important meeting and this gathering. Mr. Honda's video message will soon play. Namaskar. こんにちは。本日は日印国交樹立70周年を祝賀するセミナーの開催誠におめでとうございます。日印両国の有識者の参加を得て日印の長い友好の歴史を振り返りつつ新たな未来に向けた有意義な議論が行われることを期待します。本
さらに深めていくことで一致いたしました二国間はもちろん日米豪印の多国間での協力もさらに進めていきたいと思います先日私は日本南西アジア交流年の幕開けを記念して東京で書き初め会を開催いたしましたその際インドからの代表者は「世界は一つの家族」という意味のサンスクリット語を記しておられましたインドでとても大切にされているこの言葉は世界的な課題に手を携えて挑む日印両国の関係をよく言い表しているようにも思えます。両国が国交樹立70周年を迎える本年は官民ハイレベルの往来等により政治経済安全保障経済協力のみならず人的交流文化交流を含む幅広い分野での協力をさらに強化する絶好の機会です新型コロナウイルス感染拡大という困難を共に乗り越えこの記念すべき年を皆さんと一緒に盛り上げていきたいと思います最後になりますが日印両国の友好関係の一層の進展を心より記念し私の挨拶とさせていただきますダンニョワードありがとうございました Well,、uh, thank you very much,、uh, Mr. Honda, for your very invaluable remarks. They will definitely be of help in guiding our conversation, which is to follow thereafter. It is now my great pleasure to share with you a special message from Mr. Harsh Vardhan Shingla, the Foreign Secretary of India.、Uh, the Video message of Mr. Shingler will now play. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I would like to congratulate the Ananta Center and the Embassy of Japan for organizing this very timely conference. This year, as you are aware, marks the 70th anniversary. Of the establishment of our diplomatic relations. Both our countries are planning to organize a number of events throughout the year to commemorate this historic milestone in our relationship. On the 20th of April 1952, India and Japan signed the Treaty of Peace, which established diplomatic relations between the two countries. India had then just regained its freedom. After centuries of oppressive foreign rule, and Japan had just emerged from a devastating war. Japan's support to Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose in his historic efforts in our freedom struggle is still greatly appreciated in India. Thus, our journey began on a positive note, reflecting the age old spiritual, cultural, and civilizational ties that have bound our two nations. Over the course of the last 70 years, Japan has emerged as one of India's most trusted partners. Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi's visit to Japan in 2014 led to the elevation of our ties to a special strategic and global partnership. In the last few years, this partnership has seen tremendous progress and now covers a wide range of areas. In fact, Prime Minister Modi During the inauguration last year of the Rudraksha Convention Center in Varanasi, constructed in partnership with Japan, referred to the India Japan relationship as being one of the most natural in the region. Japan has been a valuable partner in India's developmental journey. The iconic Delhi Metro has transformed the way we imagine urban mobility. Flagship projects such as the Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Rail. Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor and the dedicated freight corridor are under various stages of implementation. The last few years have also witnessed an increasing convergence of strategic outlook, a consequence of the shift in global geopolitics towards the Indo Pacific region. This convergence is, for instance, 
reflected in our respective approaches towards the Indo-Pacific region. Both countries are working towards a free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific region. This has also a growing salience on India's Act East, Act East policy. Connectivity and other developmental projects being implemented under the India-Japan Act East Forum, which the Ambassador of Japan to India and I co-chair, are contributing to the development of the northeastern region of India. This assumes greater significance given that the Northeast is India's gateway to Southeast Asia. In addition, we are increasingly comfortable in emerging, with, in engaging with other like-minded partners in various regional and multilateral fora. As you are all aware, the pandemic has generated severe economic stresses and fundamentally altered geopolitical and geoeconomic equations. But it has also opened up prospects for India and Japan to enhance their cooperation. We need to capitalize on these opportunities. This is the mantra that should guide us as we go forward. In this regard, we should aim to develop stronger partnerships in various areas, such as enhancing defense and strategic ties, especially on defense equipment and technology, reworking supply chains to make them more resilient, trustworthy and secure, ensuring energy security for both our countries while meeting our respective obligations towards mitigating the effects of climate change through a green energy partnership, creating new innovative partnerships in manufacturing and MSME sectors, working together on frontier technologies of 5G, data analytics, blockchain, internet of things, telecom security, submarine optical fiber cable system, quantum computing, and startups, enhancing people-to-people -people linkages and human capital development through mechanisms such as the specified skill workers, forging stronger partnerships with other like-minded partners. I am sure you will have a fruitful day of candid and constructive discussions on the way forward for our bilateral relationship. As we look ahead, I wish you all success in this endeavor. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Foreign Secretary Shingler, for those uh, very insightful and very thoughtful remarks. I now have great pleasure in inviting Professor Sugata Bose, Gardiner Professor, Asianic History and Affairs, Harvard University, to make his remarks. And if I may add, uh, he has been a keen follower of uh, Indo-Japanese uh, relationship, has an insider view, and is somebody whose domain understanding of the evolution of Japanese politics and economics is quite extraordinary. I have this great honor to invite you, Professor Bose, for your observations and comments. Professor Bose. Thank you very much, uh, NK. It's a great pleasure to join this celebratory conference uh, on India-Japan relationship. I will try to um, share my screen, if that is possible, to show a few pictures, but that is not absolutely essential. I think the host may have to allow me to do so, if that is possible. If not, I will proceed. Well, subject to uh, technical issues, uh, it's a great pleasure. You can go ahead and do that. Uh, can I request the technical team, if that is possible? All right. Yes, it seems to be possible. Go ahead. Go ahead, Sugata. Okay. Well, the history of the bond between Japan and India uh, goes uh, far beyond the 70 years of a diplomatic relationship between our two countries. And as a historian, I thought I'd give you a 
little glimpse uh, into that past. In 1903, Obunindranath Tagore removed a huge European oil painting from the wall of his studio to create space for an Asian work of art to be executed by Yokoyama Taikan. The chosen theme was Rash Lila, the love play of Radha and Krishna on a full moon night. One morning, Taikan arrived at Abhinindranath's home and found that women at home had collected fresh shuli, a fragrant white autumnal flower on a plate, and some had blown across the room. Taikan picked up the flowers and scattered them on his canvas in great delight. Putting them back on the plate, he then picked up one flower in his left hand and looking at it closely from all angles, began applying white and orange colors. The moonlit night soon came alive with a rain of flowers from the sky and the breeze dropped them in the midst of the dance of Rash Lila. Taikan planted a kodam flower in Radha's hand, draped a garland of shuli flowers around her neck and curled a bunch around Krishna's flute as well. At last, the painting was hung on the wall after Taikan had framed it himself, decorating it with the border of a baluchari sari. A party was thrown for friends to come and watch Rashlila. Having learned the technique of the Japanese wash from Taikan, Obonindranath painted an arresting image of the mother nation in that style. Sister Neverita was taken by it. Initially conceived as Bongo Mata, Mother Bengal, the painting was at her suggestion retitled as Bharat Mata, Mother India. Nivedita did not fail to notice its broader Asian inspiration. So as you can see, the iconic image of the Indian nation as mother was inspired by a Japanese artistic technique. A quintessential Swadeshi internationalist, Nivedita played a key role in linking Indian nationalism with Asian universalism. It was she who had introduced Okakura, whom she had met at Vivekananda's Belur Mot, to the talented Tagore clan of Calcutta. Many years later, during his 1924 visit to Japan, Rabindranath Tagore noted the patience and time the people of Japan took to give beauty to everything that is for daily use. This, he said, is the genuine spirit of hospitality, for things that are beautiful are hospitable. Tagore was quick to explain that he did not consider any quality to be exclusively oriental. All great human ideals are universal, he asserted, only in their gr grouping, emphasis, and expression, they differ from one another. Addressing the faculty and students of Tokyo Imperial University, Tagore made a moving reference to one of your idealists who had a large heart and a great originality of mind. His name was Okakura, Tagore said. Two decades later, Netaji Shuhashchandra Bose made three visits to Japan in 1943, 1944, and received the unstinted support of the Japanese people in India's struggle for freedom. On his visit in November 1943, he was hosted by the family of Shibusawa Shakuro, whom you can see here, um, who was the head of Japan Central Bank and whose father had pioneered the financial reforms of the Meiji era and had been sought out by Binay Kumar Sharkar on his 1915 visit. Gazing at the Shingawa Gulf from the Shibusawa home in Shiba, Netaji reflected on the achievements of Meiji Japan. On November 3rd, he visited the Meiji Shrine to pay his respects on the anniversary of the adoption of the Meiji Constitution. Before the conference began that he had gone to attend, he made sure that paintings and poetry that had helped forged bonds between India and Japan 
since the turn of the 20th century would figure prominently on his itinerary. Here you see him visiting the Ueno Museum of Art with his aides Ananda Mohan Sahai and Abid Hassan. The force of his delivery, the Japanese record noted once he rose to speak, compelled every member of the conference to pay attention to every phrase of his speech. A Cambridge educated diplomat, Masayoshi Kakitsubo, was given the task of translating Netaji's speech. Decades later, he remembered being moved to tears as he rendered Bose's English speech into Japanese. A year later, in November 1944, Netaji delivered a major wide-ranging address to the faculty and students of Tokyo Imperial University. He argued that a regional order had to be the foundation of a world order. The League of Nations had failed because of the selfish and short-sighted policies of the sponsor nations. If such selfishness and short-sightedness could be abjured in Asia and the sponsor nation could work on a moral basis, the experiment to build a new international order may well succeed. He saw the challenge to rise to a high level of morality to be the task not just for the leaders and politicians, but rather the youth and the students. One country, Japan, Jawaharlal Nehru noted in a tone of regret at the Asia Relations Conference of March 1947 is not represented here and that for reasons which are beyond Japanese control or ours. However, independent India soon established full diplomatic relations with Japan in 1952. What is often forgotten is that the Bandung Conference in April 1955 enabled the quiet re-entry of Japan onto the stage of Asian and global diplomacy. Japan's participation in Bandung presaged and paved the way for Mamoru Shigemitsu as deputy uh, prime minister to lead Japan into the United Nations the following year. Here you see him with Netaji way back in 1943. The basis for peace and progress in Asia, Shigemitsu said to the UN General Assembly on that occasion in December 1956, is to be found in the economic development of the countries of the region. Soon after Nehru visited Japan, the friendship between India and Japan remained steady and steadfast in the decades that followed. Well before the idea of an Indo-Pacific interregional arena acquired political traction around 2018, Shinzo Abe, Prime Minister of Japan, had spoken eloquently before India's parliament in 2007 about the confluence of the two seas and the imperative to build a broader Asia. Conscious of the importance of history in buttressing our relationship, he traveled to Kolkata from Delhi. I had the privilege, along with my mother, Krishna Bose, to receive him at the Netaji Research Bureau and show him round the historic Netaji Bhavan. In presenting the Netaji Award exactly a month ago on January 23rd, 2022, to former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, we reaffirmed the historic bond between India and Japan. The 70th anniversary of our warm diplomatic ties affords a marvelous opportunity for us to together build a better Asia and a better world. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Bose, for uh, those very wide ranging remarks uh, embedded in history, embedded in understanding, and as a reminder that our relationship goes far beyond the 70 years which we are privileged and fortunate to celebrate today. Indeed, some of the concepts which you brought out in the paintings which uh, were part of your presentation are really quite extraordinary 
in highlighting how deep our relationship is and how each one of us have sought to inf influence each other's thinking. And that the concept of the confluence goes far beyond the tentative efforts which are being made now. Thank you very much, Professor Bose, for those really, really outstanding remarks. I now have the great honor and privilege to invite uh, Ms. Uh, Rui Matsukawa, the member of the House of Counselors in Japan, to make her valuable comments and contribution to this important occasion. Can I request you for your remarks? Thank you very much. Uh, it is certainly my great honor uh, and pleasure to be uh, uh, participating in this important conference, celebrating the 70th anniversary between Japan and Indian uh, wonderful cooperation. And uh, I would like to reiterate uh, uh, that on behalf of the Japanese people, the Japanese people have a natural affection to Indian uh, culture and also a deep respect. And not just that, I would like to also uh, remind that after the devastated war, uh, as some of you are aware, that international tribunal in Tokyo, it was only Judge Pal, Indian, was the only one judge who uh, gave a not guilty uh, judgment to all defendants. And that's also one of the memories that the Japanese people uh, still bring. And today I'd like to uh, talk about why Japan and India are natural partners. I do believe we are. Uh, because not just as I mentioned, uh, uh, natural affection through the uh, friendly relations between, all through the history, but uh, also one as a talent wise, I think the Japanese people and the Indian people has a really a supplementary talents. Let's say the Japanese are pretty uh, well known for the production, uh, you know, capability like uh, craftsmanship, whereas Indians are genius and very good at in uh, computing and also the software creation. So in uh, economic technologically our uh, cooperation, I think the Japanese and Indians had a lot to share and lots to learn each other. And not just uh, that uh, deep back uh, to the history, Japan and India are the one of the most oldest democracies in Asia. And we share the value of freedom and democracies. And as, uh, as the previous uh, Professor Sugata mentioned, I also would like to come back to uh, the point that not just the values, but I think the Japan and, and India do share a strategic interest that makes our, our partnership even more stronger, which means, um, as the, uh, the 2007 Prime Minister Abe's visit to Indian Parliament, and he made a great speech, confluence of the two seas, the Pacific and Indian Ocean, saying that uh, it's a time to bring in about the two seas, uh, as, uh, about the dynamic coupling of seas of freedom and prosperity. And that was uh, actually the origin of the present to be very, very popular, uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. The agenda actually came out of the origin is uh, this speech. And the idea of leaking uh, the, the corridor of the freedom and, and uh, prosperity by sandwiching Japan and India and connecting the oceans, that is a component, the basic foundation of Japan proposed uh, free and open Indo-Pacific agenda. And when Prime Minister Abe came back to his second term, he uh, formally announced in this Indo-Pacific agenda at the at conference. Sorry, I got a phone, I have to decode. I hope I'm, I'm still on, okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So, and then that's, not just because Japan and, and India share the, the strategic value of keeping the law of, rule of law or the freedom of navigation, but also geopolitically speaking, India and Japan locates perfectly, perfect position to secure these two seas. That's the reason uh, I think the uh, Japan and India can be a natural allies, you know, in terms of natural partnership in 
maintaining the peace and stability in Indo-Pacific. I was uh, under Prime Minister Suga, the previous administration. I served as a parliamentary vice minister for defense. And Marabal, uh, which took place in Indian Ocean, organized by India and uh, four countries, quad countries, Japan, India, and US, Australia joined. That was a, a very re remarkable joint drill to show that the commitment of the four countries to maintain the peace and stability in Indo-Pacific. And not just that, I think the uh, India and Japan has more cooperation in the military equipment transfer uh, and the technologies. I think I see a lot of chances there. So that is another area that I think Japan and India can work even uh, deeper. And also uh, another area is, again, economic security is a very important agenda now in Japan, Japanese politics. The present parliament, uh, diet session, we are going to uh, uh, pass the legislation to secure uh, the economic uh, security, and which actually uh, secures the uh, guarantees the uh, license for the sensitive license for the, pe the persons and the companies to request licenses for the companies and, and people to um, deal with the sensitive uh, technologies or protecting the um, fundamental infrastructure or uh, supporting the important supply chains, uh, including like uh, semiconductor sectors. So I think India uh, certainly is uh, the, the, the country Japan trusts and have a very high technologies together. We can uh, make, uh, I think Japan and India are perfect match to uh, secure, to, to sort of sustain a secure supply chain together. And other areas we can think about is a startup and uh, uh, to, uh, the innovation. As I mentioned, I think Japan, Japanese and Indians are the perfect partner to um, to sort of supplement each other's, I think, the uh, talents. And uh, if Japanese companies and Indian companies can work together, or the Japanese youth and uh, Indian young people work together, I think we will have an excellent uh, incubator for the innovation. I, I truly believe. And also, in that regards, I think the uh, education is another area for, uh, I think Japan and India can work harder. It is one regret that India and Japan enjoy such a great relationship, but still I think the exchange of the people, not just because of the COVID-19, but even before that, I think, I really hoped we, we have, our two countries can have more people-to-people uh, -people exchange, especially younger people. And, and then again, I, I speak business. And lastly, I would like to also mention again that the maritime cooperation is a very important area. Uh, I think it is our destiny to work together. Looking at the map, India locates in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and Japan locates the edge of the Pacific. And through this Pacific and Indian Ocean, we have the uh, very important um, uh, strategic, uh, you know, Malacca Straits in the South China Sea, and we have China. Now that the Ukraine crisis, look at that. I think now that China and Russia are living in the 19th century's real politic uh, mindsets, but I think the Japan and India can work together with all another partners to um, to create and stabilize the international peace and prosperity together. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Matsukawa-san, um, distinguished uh, member of the House of Councillors. I'm indeed touched that you mentioned about the dissenting judgment of uh, uh, Radhavinod Pal. Uh, mm. uh, having lived in Japan, I, I fully agree with you mm -hmm. how much this forms a part of the Japanese psyche when yes. they begin to look at the whole history and evolution of the relationship between our two countries. So thank you very mm -hmm. much uh, for really reminding us of the great uh, dissenting note of Vinod uh, Pal uh, <laughs> on that famous uh, war tribunal case. Also, I think that you have highlighted very correctly the importance of uh, the natural synergy between India and Japan. Uh, 
the confluence of uh, the two Indo-Pacific region and the talent, not only for craftsmanship, but in terms of innovation and in terms of incubation and what together can be done to really bring about economic development patterns to the mutual benefit mm -hmm. of the two countries. Now, so thank you very much uh, uh, for those uh, really uh, uh, far-reaching remarks and observations. I now have the great pleasure in inviting Ambassador Satoshi Suzuki, uh, Excellency, uh, the Ambassador for Japan to India. And you have already in your short period, notwithstanding the pandemic, done uh, every conceivable effort to make sure that the momentum of cooperation between the two countries is taken forward. Uh, so uh, we look forward, Ambassador, to your valuable observations. Ambassador Suzuki. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. N.K. Sin, uh, Chairman, 15th Finance Commission, Government of India, and uh, Trustee Anand Aspen Center. Mr. Honda Taro, Parliamentary Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs. Mr. Hash Bardan Shringra, Foreign Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs. Professor Sugata Bos, Guardian and Professor, Oceanic History and Affairs, Harvard University. Ms. Matsukawa Rui, member of uh, the House of Councillors and uh, former Parliamentary Vice Minister for Defense. His Excellency, Mr. Sanjay Kumar Balma, Ambassador of India to, uh, to Japan. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Namaskar and Konnichiwa. Um, it is my pleasure to join uh, this opening session uh, with the presence of distinguished uh, leaders, uh, political, economic, and academic of the two countries. Japanese Embassy is honored uh, to co-host this seminar together with uh, Ananta Center, supported by the Ministry of External Affairs of India. For this year, as everyone mentioned, 2022 uh, marks the 70th anniversary of the establishment of Japan-India diplomatic uh, relations. We will celebrate uh, this uh, significant occasion through a series of uh, commemorative events. I'm pleased to see today's seminar taking place, uh, the purpose of which is to revisit the bilateral relationship between Japan and India to highlight success stories of our partnership over the past seven decades and to chart uh, the future course of our bilateral relationship. Let me take this opportunity to reflect upon the history of Japan-India relations and to envision the future trajectory, trajectory of our uh, cooperative partnership. Filtered through Buddhism, Indian culture has had a significant influence of Japanese culture. Even today, when you visit uh, Japanese temples, uh, either in uh, Kyoto, Nara, uh, you come across uh, characters from uh, Devanagari script being used for uh, performance, performancing rituals uh, by Buddhist monks. This is uh, just one of the examples of age old ties between our two nations. In modern times, the close interaction between our two peoples uh, was characterized by intellectual exchanges as beautifully described by Professor uh, Bose uh, minutes before. After World War II, uh, return to the international community as a sovereign country was the top priority for Japan and India consistently supported Japan's aspiration. As the then Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru uh, respected Japan's uh, freedom and honor, India chose to sign a peace treaty with Japan bilaterally instead of uh, signing the multilateral San Francisco Peace Treaty. We established then our diplomatic relations in April 1952. Reciprocating India's generosity at the Indian economic crisis in 1991, uh, Japan offered a substantial bridge loan to India to bail out 
uh, India out of the balance of payment crisis, even when most of developed countries were reluctant to offer finance to India. After this crisis, India has gone through a series of major econ economic reforms and actively and uh, successfully invited foreign investment, especially in the manufacturing sector. Maruti Suzuki achieved a steady growth in India during 1990s, thanks to the India's positive automotive policies. These days, Maruti Suzuki has a significant market share and also contributes to making India initiative to transform India into a global manufacturing hub. President Suzuki of Suzuki Motor Corporation uh, is going to uh, share his views with us today. So I'm looking forward to it. With this long history of uh, having each other's back today, Japan and India are indispensable to each other on any fronts. Japan has been the largest bilateral ODA donor to India and one of the largest investors in the Indian economy. Metro rail project, especially Delhi Metro, uh, are a testament to successful stories in this uh, field, as previous speakers uh, mentioned. And uh, Mumbai Ahmedabad high-speed rail, it's, uh, which is uh, India's ever biggest infrastructure project, shall be that of the next generation. I would also like to emphasize how Japan and India complement each other as uh, partners for growth, as uh, uh, Matsukawa sensei just uh, mentioned. Japan prides itself on high-end technology and the workforce with discipline. However, we are faced with uh, challenges such as declining population and aging society. Thus, we are in need for business opportunities overseas, as well as young professional workers coming to Japan. India, on the other hand, has a great pool of young talent and skilled workers. Further, India still has development need. I believe this economic complementarity uh, ties us even closer. Particularly in the last decade, our political relations have also flourished. When Honorable Prime Minister Modi visited Japan in 2014, he and the then Prime Minister uh, Abe agreed to uh, elevate the bilateral relationship to the special strategic and global partnership. With strong support from our leaders, uh, the scope of Japan-India cooperation is now unparalleled. We see our collaboration widening and deepening day by day. Importantly, our ties are no longer limited to bilateral terms, but it now focuses on bringing positive development to the Indo-Pacific region. Based on shared economic and security interests, as well as common values of democracy, freedom, and the rule of law, Japan and India see each other as a natural partner to promote a free, open and inclusive in the Pacific. After India announced IPOI, uh, Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative in 2019, Japan decided to become a lead country for the connectivity pillar of this initiative to uh, boost this uh, joint effort. The Quad is another key framework through which Japan and India together with other partners have been working in tandem to facilitate the positive agenda in the region. Through efforts such as uh, vaccine partnership, along with uh, cooperation on infrastructure, climate, education, technologies, cyber and space, we strive to extend a practical hand to uh, the entire Indo-Pacific region. As Prime Minister Modi uh, rightly put it, uh, during the first in-person Quad Summit meeting last September, the Quad is a force for global good. Japan and India are accelerating our efforts with this spirit. 
As I look back at the uh, last 70 years, Japan and India have uh, come a long way uh, to become what we are today, natural and indispensable partners. Over the past two years, the pandemic has limited our physical interactions. However, our work and the bilateral cooperation has, been, uh, has seen steady progress. As high-level bilateral uh, exchanges are crucial for further enhancing our relationship, I do hope uh, that we can arrange our Prime Minister's visit to India at the uh, earliest possible opportunity. We also look forward to a welcoming Prime Minister Modi to Japan uh, on the occasion of Puat Summit meeting in Tokyo, expected by the end of June this year. I'm confident that today's seminar will provide a new impetus to the relationship between Japan and India. I very much look, look forward to candid and uh, vibrant discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Suzuki, for so succinctly summing up the evolution of uh, Indo-Japanese relations embedded in Buddhism and many such things to the present day pursuits in terms of technological excellence, Maruti Suzuki, uh, the, the high speed uh, transition from, uh, from Mumbai to Ahmedabad, to other initiatives and to the connectivity pillar, now really uh, in many multiple ways on the Indo-Pacific and the new initiatives in the Quad, as well as what the potential really holds. So thank you very much, Ambassador Suzuki. I now request uh, Ambassador Sanjay Verma, our, our ambassador to Japan, who has worked there under this difficult period of pandemic to keep this initiative going. Uh, we are looking forward to hearing from you, Ambassador Verma. Ambassador Verma. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, His Excellency Mr. Taro Honda, Parliamentary Vice Minister in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan, Foreign Secretary of India, His Excellency Ambassador Harshwardhan Shringala, Ambassador Satoshi Suzuki, Ambassador of Japan to India, Sri N.K. Singh, Chairman of 15th Finance Commission, Government of India, and Trustee, Anand Aspen Center, Uri Matsukawa Sensei, Member of House of Consulars in Japan, Professor Sugat Bose, Gardner Professor, Oceanic History and Affairs, Harvard University, distinguished guests, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Namaskar, Konnichiwa. I am honored and humbled at the same time to share my views on Japan and India, 70 years of cooperation and the way forward in the august presence of stalwarts of international relations. India-Japan Spatial Strategic and Global Partnership has witnessed an intense intermingling and convergence of our respective national interests. Today, we see India and Japan as two leading and complementary economies that play a key role in promoting peace, security, stability, and sustainable development in the Indo-Pacific region and the world at large. The underlying strength of our partnership is shaped through our shared objectives and common values, such as democracy, freedom, humanism, the rule of law, respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity underpinned with international law. We have been working closely to achieve our common strategic vision of a sustainable world order. 2022 marks the 70th anniversary of establishment of our diplomatic relations. As we look at this important milestone, we see many new avenues for India-Japan cooperation. India-Japan partnership is reflected in the vast array of institutional mechanisms that we have established. Annual summits, foreign ministers strategic dialogue, defense ministerial dialogue, two plus two ministerial dialogue, and many more. Our bilateral strategic partnership is concretized in engagements such as the Quad and Supply Chain Resilience Initiative. To us, Quad is a partnership for global good. Quad summits have highlighted our shared commitments in areas such as climate change, COVID-19 vaccine development and distribution, critical and emerging technologies, space, cybersecurity, connectivity, infrastructure development, counterterrorism, and maritime security. 
SCRI is aimed at securing end-to-end -end supply chains, reducing over-reliance on a single country, peaceful resolution of disputes, respect for international law, including that of UNCLOS, and opposition to unilateral attempts to change the status quo through use of force. Defense and security cooperation has emerged as one of the most important pillars of India-Japan partnership and an important factor in ensuring peace and stability in the region. We see immense potential for increasing defense technology cooperation. India and Japan have been leaders in innovation throughout our individual and shared histories. As we continue to add new dimensions to our partnership while cooperating in the fields of long-standing areas, platforms like India Stack can act as a catalyst to achieve our shared objectives of a digital society. India-Japan Digital Partnership is the cornerstone of our convergence in digital area in view of synergies between Japan's digitization efforts and India's Digital India, Startup India and Skill India initiatives. With rapidly increasing active internet users in India, opportunities in frontier technologies of 5G and beyond, big data analytics, quantum computing, blockchain, Internet of Things, telecom security, and submarine optical fiber cable system are under various phases of implementation. New industrial collaborations are in the making, even as we speak. Complementarity between the two countries can facilitate new, innovative, and alternate models of partnership. To make this possible, both countries need to come together to co-innovate, co-create, and co-produce for both domestic and global markets by combining their strengths and competitiveness. Pharmaceuticals, medical device manufacturing and research and development hold a promising future for India-Japan collaborations. India is the pharmacy of the world and Japanese research and development can provide affordable, safe and quality medicines and diagnostic equipment in the medicine sector. We are also exploring cooperation in areas such as Ayurveda, yoga, wellness and development of high standards healthcare system. We have wide ranging cooperation with Japan to promote science and technology in the areas of life sciences, material sciences, high energy physics, biotechnology, healthcare, methane hydrate, robotics, alternative source of energy and earth sciences. The two space agencies, ISRO and JAXA, are also pursuing future cooperative activities in the use and exploration of outer space for peaceful purposes. Both sides are also collaborating in nuclear energy and nuclear technology. India and Japan are also exploring collaborations in critical minerals and new and emerging strategic technologies that are shaping our futures. There is a critical need to collaborate on semiconductor fabrication units, 6G technology, and mining and processing of critical minerals. We are exploring cooperation in cloud computing and secured networks. Under climate cooperation, partnership with Japan to develop and share supercritical technology, including green hydrogen and green ammonia, would be essential to developing clean technology supply chains for mutual benefits. We continue to deepen cooperation on people-to-people -people exchange and human resource development. There are more than 12,500 Indians in Japan who are having highly skilled visa among a total of over 40,000 Indians. We are focusing on human resource capacity building through 17 Japanese Institute of Manufacturing and seven Japanese endowment courses aimed at skilling people in Japanese work culture and processes. In addition, after the success of technical inter intern training program, TITP in short, with Japan, the signing of a memorandum of cooperation on a specified skilled workers would be promising enabler of skill matching. We are also working to overcome the challenge of language barrier by establishing Japanese language schools in India. The ever strengthening component of people to people contacts through cultural exchanges has been an important pillar that deepened and expanded our partnership. The launch of India Japan Forum last year with Ananta Center at its helms and with participation of eminent personalities from government, parliament, industry, media, and academia from India and Japan was another important development 
towards deepening mutual understanding. In the end, I would like to emphasize that India-Japan partnership is shaping the contours of regional peace, stability, and prosperity. It won't be wrong to claim that India and Japan are key to much awaited and much wanted international geostrategic stability. Namaskar. Thank you. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Verma, for uh, your very valuable observations, uh, which relate not only to the quest, common quest for a sustainable world order, but exploring the nascent areas. Uh, you highlighted the importance of skill matching and the inculcation really on the education front uh, uh, with as special initiatives. As we extend our cooperation, to pharma, to 6G, to cloud computing, to space. Uh, these are all added dimensions. So I think that, uh, on, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Verma, for highlighting some of those very important areas where our potential has yet to be realized. So friends, we have had a very enriching exchange as the first session of today's conference. There is congruity that, uh, embedded in history, guided by shared common values, the importance of the moral dimension of international cooperation, which has been brought out, the fact that the importance of the Indo-Pacific region in terms of maritime security, new dimensions of Indo-Japanese cooperation, our potential of cooperation and complementarity is far from being realized. Today's uh, inaugural session has highlighted uh, many of the opportunities and the challenges which would enable both countries to improve their life quality, to act to the betterment of their people and to act as an important force for global stability and peace, which goes beyond the region as a whole. I think that there was an uh, per se reference to turmoils elsewhere. And I think that as compared to that, I think that the reinforcing of Indo-Japanese cooperation in multiple dimensions will act as a force for good, as a force for global stability and shared prosperity. I think this is the importance of this inaugural session recognizing that it is not merely 70 years, but for much longer period of history and the huge untapped opportunities which lie ahead of us. We have some important sessions today which go into the specifics of this. And I now have the great pleasure of handing over to uh, on the important issue of economic cooperation, of handing over to Dr. Navshad Forbes, the co-chairman of Forbes Marshall Private and chairman of the Ananta Aspen Center for the next session on invigorating the India-Japan Economic Partnership. Over to you, Navshad. Thank you very much, NK, and thank you everyone for a great start to our uh, program today. Um, I was uh, really, I mean, I, I learned a great deal about our relationship and our historical relationship and this historical ties. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we're, we're delighted to have a really high powered and distinguished group of panelists today uh, for our session on invigorating the India-Japan Economic Partnership. We have Mayumi Murayama, who's the Executive Vice President of JETRO, uh, Rajan Navani, who's the Vice Chairman and Managing Director of the Jetline Group of Companies, uh, Toshihiro Suzuki, who's the President of Suzuki Motor Corporation, and Banmali Agrawala, who's the President of Infrastructure Defense and Global Corporate Affairs at Tata Sons. Um, I'll make uh, one introductory comment uh, and then go straight to our panelists. Uh, we will, uh, I'm aware that we are slightly behind schedule and we will try to make up a little time, but we will at least not, uh, not fall further back uh, in this session. Um, 
my premises that our trade ties do not reflect the potential, the warmth of our relationship and the desire to collaborate. Uh, we heard so strongly this, this morning um, about our historic ties um, and the great, the great warmth that exists between our two countries. We see these the showing increasingly in our strategic cooperation as well. Why do I say that our trade ties does not reflect this potential? If we look back over the last 20 years, 20 years ago, um, India's total imports from Japan were about two and a half billion dollars. Uh, these, these have risen to 13 billion now. Uh, India's exports to Japan 20 years ago were about $1.7 billion, which have risen to around $4.7 billion now. So the trade relationship has grown. But if we compare it to India's total trade in the same 20-year period, when our total imports and exports have grown by roughly a factor of 10, then it says that in in 2000, Japan accounted for around 5% of India's total imports, which is down now to 2.5%. And India's exports to Japan accounted for just under 5% of our total exports 20 years ago, which is down now to about 1.5% of our total exports. So 10 years, so if we take the period 10 years before we signed the SEPA, uh, 10 years after we signed the SEPA as the two endpoints of this 20 year period, what it says is that we actually, that Japan accounted for a larger share of our imports and exports in 2000 than it does today. And that's really counter to the warmth, the strategic relationship, um, and clearly the potential that exists in our relationship. So we do need to invigorate the economic partnership between our two countries. We have a great panel today uh, to help us think of how this relationship can be invigorated. I'll go first to uh, Mayumi Murayama from JETRO, um, and then go on to Rajan Navani, then to Mr. Suzuki, and then to but Mali. So uh, the thought is that if we can, uh, our introductory comments could be, uh, you know, five, six minutes, um, and then we will have some time for a round of questions amongst us, and then uh, open it up to some questions from the floor as well. So over to you, Murayama san. Thank you very much, Dr. Naushat. The distinguished chairman, speakers, uh, moderator, and the participants of this seminar. It is my great honor to be invited for this commemorative conference celebrating 70 years of India-Japan diplomatic relationship. I also like, would like to combine my deep gratitude to the kind support of Anant Aspen Center of officers led by Ms. Kiran Pasricha. Uh, if you allow me to talk about myself a bit, my first visit to India was uh, way back in 1984. As a fresh graduate, I visited Bangladesh first. I went to see the country alone as uh, I was assigned to work on that country in a research organization, Institute of Developing Economies, which I am in charge now as an executive vice president today. After spending 10 days in Dhaka, I flew to Kolkata to see another Bengal, but it was just the day after the Prime Minister, Ms., uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi was assassinated. That time I was not aware how such a political shock would impact the Indian society. Somehow I could catch a bus uh, from the airport and to reach the Ramakrishna mission. And uh, I spent a few days there uh, confined without knowing what was going on outside and left country. It was my first engagement with India. Now I work in Japanese government agency called JETRO, Japan External Trade Organization, as a research 
as my research institute was merged with JETRO in 1998 under the auspices of the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. JETRO's mission is to promote trade and investment between Japan and other countries. Uh, however, I, I myself is, is in charge of research side and uh, not directly involved in that business related function. So what I would share with you today is mostly based on my learning from my colleagues and on the do other documented uh, related documents. With this caveat or oh, excuse, let me come to the point. As Dr. Forbes mentioned about the trend of India uh, Japan trade, I'd like to elaborate the point a bit from historical ex perspective. As everybody said, uh, though 2022 is the 70th year to establish a diplomatic relationship between India and Japan, as our we all we know that our history of engagement began look on long back. If we look back at economic relationship, we can recall that for the development of modern industry, especially textile industry in Japan, Indian cotton yarn played an indispensable role. From around 1877, its import increased tremendously. Within 10 years, the share of import from British India rose from 1% to 12%. Uh, 20, 12%. However, the rapid growth of Japanese uh, spinning industry made the self-sufficiency in cotton yarn possible by 1897. As the result, the import of Indian yarn decreased after hitting the record in 1890. In place of cotton yarn, demand for Indian raw cotton surged. To decrease the freight cost of import, direct shipping line between uh, Bombay and Kobe was opened in 1893. For that, there are huge contributions made by Jamshed G. Tata and Shibusawa Eiji, the two outstanding nationalist entrepreneurs of the time. Thanks to Bombay Line, India trading houses were opened in Kobe and Yokohama thereafter. If you look back at the composition of trade in nine, around 1930s, raw cotton accounted for almost 90% of Japan's import from India. And in Japan's export, cotton products accounted for about 35, 35%. That was the basic structure of trade. Import of pig iron from India began after the First World War. Until the Second World War, there were three important directions in Japan's trade structure. Trade with British India was one of them, along with, uh, with US and with East Asia. Thus, in pre-war period, the economic relations was very conspicuous in the bilateral relationship. From the economic uh, relationship point of view, the post-war period until the economic liberalization of India can be divided into several era. The first period starts from the resumption of bilateral trade in 1948 to the second oil shock in around 1979. It was an era of post-war uh, reconstruction followed by high economic growth in Japan. Whereas in India, it was a time of planned economic development of newly independent country. The trade centered around cotton before the war, transformed into one around iron and steel. In the post-war era, iron ore replaced pig iron as a major imported product from, uh, of Japan, uh, from India. And Indian raw, sorry, Indian iron ore played a critical role in the remarkable post-war development of Japanese steel industry. Japanese export to India mainly consisted of iron and steel products and capital machineries. It is said that the period until 1965 was a golden age in the economic history of India and Japan, as both countries underwent 
the process of development simultaneously, and in, it resulted in the expansion, um, expansion of trade and other relations such as provision of uh, yen credit. After 1965, due to economic downturn in India, the bilateral trade was also affected. While Japan was uh, second or third largest partner for India in terms of, in terms of both import and export, the position of India in Japan's trade lowered. To the contrary, Japanese investment and economic relations went to and expanded in Southeast Asia extensively. Overpresence of Japanese business was criticized as reflected in a big demonstration that took place in Jakarta in 1974 against the visiting Prime Minister Tanaka Kakue. In the decade of 1980s, India's position in the Japan's overall trade declined further, accounting only 1% in both export and import. While Japan remained an important partner at India's side, since the latter half of 1970s, gem and jewelry appeared as one of the main export items from India to Japan. Export of shrimp also grew rapidly in the 1980s. If we see the trend of investment by Japanese firms in India, the first engagement of Japanese firms in the post-war period was technical collaboration in producing electric wire in 1950. In 1951, overseas investment and loan was made to develop iron ore mine in Goa. The first joint venture was a firm to produce fountain pen established in Madras in 1954. Between 1951 and 1990, almost 40 years, there were only 167 investments made by Japanese business in India. That was merely 0.3% of all Japanese FDIs of the period. Under such a stagnant state of affairs, Maruti Uduk Limited, a joint venture between Indian government and Suzuki in 1982, made a history. With the presence, presence of Mr. Suzuki today, I do not have to explain what Suzuki mean in our bilateral history. An article written by an Indian scholar stated, Although there are not many brands that became a part of nation's psyche, one brand in the automobile sector that is etched very strongly in the minds of the consumers is Maruti 800. Other mobile uh, automobile makers such as Toyota, Honda, Nissan, and Mitsubishi followed Suzuki. Japanese outbound FDY surged after Plaza Agreement in 1985, but it mostly went to uh, East Asian countries. Despite impressive entry by Suzuki, overall Japanese FDYs to India did not show much vigor. After the introduction of economic reforms and outward oriented policy in 1991, Japanese FDY in, in India increased substantially, but the boom was short lived due to India's nuclear test in 1998 and subsequent economic sanctions. It was not until until the mid 2000s, when India began to make another constant high growth and FDY inflow from the world increased and reached uh, $30 billion in 2007. Although less in volume compared to Japanese FDY, FDI to ASEAN China, Japanese FDI to India began to make a constant increase after 2007. With respect to trade, there have been some improvement after 2003, but the performance has been largely overshadowed in comparison to other bilateral trading relations, such as those of India ASEAN, India China, and India Korea. India Japan bilateral trade was surpassed by India China trade in 2002 and three, and even by India, uh, India Korea trade in 2005 6. In 2011, Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, SEPA, came into effect. So far, uh, we have seen the up and downs, or rather stagnant trade, and the state of FDI inflow much less uh, uh, than East and Asian countries in the past, I mean, from the Japanese side. 
Although the results seem uh, not yet being achieved, it is uh, true that there have been high expectations among Japanese firms towards India as a promising country for business expansion. According to the survey of Japan Bank of International Cooperation, JBIC, in 2021, India ranked second following China in the list of promising countries for business expansion during coming three years. The ranking was same in the previous year. India was followed by US, Vietnam, and Thailand. That's simply compared with those other four countries in the best five, uh, five countries in the perceptions of Japanese firms, we could see the largest and exploited scope in India. In the list of promising countries for over 10 years to come, India is ranked number one. The number of Japanese farms in India increased from 550 in 2008 to almost uh, 1500 in 2020. The increase of bases, namely head office, branch, and sales office, were higher from 1800 to almost 5000. The composition shows almost half were engaged in manufacturing and, and among them, automobile sector uh, accounts for 10%. Wholesale and retail sector account for 15%, followed by IT sector with 6%. Service sector is on increase. Retail, food processing and restaurants are recent entrants. COVID-19 pandemic, US-China conflict, and other global issues have changed the landscape of inter-country relationship. The importance of India has risen, risen significantly for Japan in both political and economic dimensions. Global supply chain resilience, digital transformation, green transformation, nurturing and sourcing of highly skilled human resources are four pillars around which Japan wants to engage with India now and in coming years. I do not go into the details here, but what I could say is that as far as I see, Japan is aware that we have to strive to become a country to be chosen by India as a best partner to work towards the future. And I'm sure we are ready for that. Lastly, Jetri has five offices in India. We are ready to play a part to achieve the goal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Murayama san. Uh, thank you. That was both very interesting and very comprehensive, and it gave us a perspective of uh, the historical perspective on our on our economic relationship. Thank you. I'd like to move next to Rajan Navani from the Jetline Group. Over to you, Rajan. Thank you. Thank you, Noshad. Uh, always a pleasure uh, to be here and especially on such a momentous occasion of celebrating 70 years of uh, an India-Japan relationship. And I think when I look at that logo, you know, with the, the peacock and the green pheasant, uh, especially in such times, you know, where we've got a global crisis all around. And I was just looking up, you know, the, the symbolism of peace uh, and particularly being able to be a relationship that enables regional cooperation in a manner very different from many other partners. I think the India-Japan relationship really stands out. And, you know, the green pheasant apparently, uh, you know, gives an indication of an earthquake even before humans can detect it. And I think, you know, the crisis that we faced with the pandemics and now wars, uh, you know, I think is, is really a reason for both of our countries to be able to, you know, see crises in advance, see how we can plan our strategies in a manner that would not only protect our two countries' interests, but of the world at large. And I therefore look at this relationship really as one of the most important relationships for our country, you know, as we move forward. You know, having said that, um, I, I'm going to limit my comments, Naushad, in the limited amount of time, more towards an area that, uh, you know, we've been spending a lot more uh, time on the business side uh, uh, through our group, uh, especially with Japan, uh, you know, on the areas of, of digital technology. And again, you know, in the areas of this, this entire geopolitical, uh, you know, players trying to influence the future of the digital revolution, I think it is important for us as countries 
to look at what are those common values that are going to drive how the adoption of technologies are going to take up because digital and technology are going to influence pretty much every sector you know as we know it every traditional sector uh, is going to be impacted if it hasn't already uh, if we heard our honorable finance minister of india speech in the budget recently the word digital appeared before every single you know uh, sectoral uh, reference that was made and i know through you know digital india smart city startup india kind of initiatives in india and a very advanced society 5.0 initiative in japan which really talks about technology and digital impacting society and every single citizen of the country very differently i think the efforts that we are looking at iot and particularly around you know areas of of transformation that will come out of new emerging technologies be it ai 5g uh, you know cybersecurity and others i think it's going to be exceedingly critical for us to see how we can collaborate deeply both in terms of how our private to private partnerships can play out but also on on the policy side really how do we innovate policy making for this new emerging era uh, that is coming and i think there's a lot to learn you know from our two countries i know japan recently announced a a, a very strong r&d tax a break for ai led r&d technologies defining that you know i think india has also taken a huge leap around these areas so i think if we look at different aspects there are no number of opportunities for us to look at how will we look at ethics particularly in ai you know when man and machine are working together how does it impact both world the the workplace as well as you know citizen behavior i think these are all very important issues uh, which are strategic and i think best resolved when there can be a bilateral kind of uh, agreement on some of the next steps and then use that as a mechanism to engage you know other stakeholders around the world so i think there's an important relationship you know for us as two countries uh, to really uh, you know build upon having said that i think there are a number of emerging technologies and sectors that are you know that can really enable us to to position our two countries at a you know at a global world leadership level and i'm going to you know just share one area you know which is an area which our group has been involved in uh, you know from the 80s in the you know consumer entertainment space uh, through music with joint ventures with pioneer and video and you know consumer companies like uh, studios in hollywood which were owned by japanese companies like sony and then now more recently into gaming uh, you know which is again an area it's a huge 990 billion dollar global industry japan has got about 17 billion dollars so now shall in the context of the numbers you mentioned you know on where the opportunities of significant growth can come uh, you know india is still at about a 1 billion dollar industry in the gaming space uh, and if we can look at an industry that's growing at nearly 25 to 30% you know year on year in countries like india where while we represent just about maybe 1% or less than a percent of the global business uh, you know recent reports showed that especially on the smartphone android mobile platform 17% of the world's global downloads happened uh, in a country like india so large engagement you know very high user base uh, you know it's predicted that from a 350 million gamer community today we could go up to about 600 million over the next 4 years uh, and japan uh, which is the world's largest or the highest average revenue per user market so very few players but very strong monetization very strong ways in which people engage i mean if we bring these two aspects together i think we can create solutions that will not only work for countries like india and of course strongly improve what we can do in each other's countries but also accelerate you know global development in many such areas this is you know just one example in an area that you know we have been engaged in but uh, there are so many similar opportunities i believe that will continue to come up uh, you know especially as we look at areas that are being disrupted uh, through innovative technology and and that's where i think uh, you know the startup ecosystems that are being built up particularly in india in each of the spaces you look at health you look at agriculture you look at food you look at fintech you look at you know uh, urbanization one looks at energy efficiency waste management every single area uh, you know the number of startups that are coming up in india 
the entrepreneurial energy, the ability to deploy good talent at scale, uh, you know, could be a very strong complementarity to the investment power that Japanese companies have. Uh, so I think the private to private sector uh, partnership, really building upon, you know, the, the bridges that we have really built over, uh, you know, the past and strengthening those, uh, you know, maybe in a way expediting a little bit, uh, you know, from both of our countries could also help shape that. Like we always believe, you know, in India, and I personally have seen that relationships, uh, you know, particularly on the business side between our two countries take a relatively longer time to, to fructify, but once they are built, you know, they are rock solid because they're built on the right pillars, you know, which will drive both growth of business and again, business and growth on the right foundations and the right values that are of global, uh, you know, help and that will strengthen that. Uh, just two, uh, you know, small points I want to talk about uh, before I pass it back to you, Naushad. One is the entire area of cybersecurity really becoming a very, very strong uh, a place for us to, again, you know, come out as strong partners, be it, you know, as members of the Quad or in many other different ways, while we have formed some, you know, groupings around that, I think there is an increased need to accelerate the pace at which, you know, we engage in these areas because, you know, the, the number of, you know, phishing attacks and cyber espionage, ransomware attacks, and now increasingly what is happening with the development of you know, digital currencies. And I know Japan has taken a very strong position uh, on cryptocurrencies, actually part of the Bitcoin, et cetera, being recognized as asset classes. Countries like India, you know, are still trying to understand how to, you know, develop some of these, uh, you know, technologies areas, the bringing together or coming together of, of content, uh, you know, with technology, uh, creating user experiences of a multiverse and uh, a metaverse. Uh, are all areas which are, you know, real. And I think at the core of uh, that, as well as, you know, manufacturing and so many other aspects, you know, cybersecurity will, will be one critical, you know, area for us to, to, to kind of tackle uh, together. And I think the, the last point I want to mention is that, you know, this entire digital transformation piece uh, is something that, you know, is, is kind of bringing together multiple technologies moving at the same time. And I think that is the excitement. As a matter of fact, through Ananta, you know, I chaired a, a roundtable on, on, on artificial intelligence, digital transformation, and we went into depth into all of these areas as to where could be the specific opportunities, both for a G2G, B2G, uh, you know, and a B2B collaboration uh, to happen. So I think increasing our engagement, increasing our understanding, increasing, you know, you know, the, 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 the values on which our partnership is built and strengthening and accelerating that, you know, over the next 30 years, as this relationship moves uh, to a hundred year relationship is something that, you know, I, I would like to leave, uh, you know, with all the audience here uh, to see and consider how can we really build a framework and a, and a mechanism uh, to, to accelerate that, particularly led by our two private sectors. So, so thank you and back to you now, Shad. Thank you, Rajan. And uh, I hope we can come back to some of the important themes that you mentioned in the Q&A a little later on. Uh, our next uh, speaker, I go to uh, Mr. Toshihiro Suzuki, uh, the president of Suzuki Motor Corporation. Um, Suzuki-san will speak in Japanese. And if you wish to hear a translation, there's an interpretation button at the bottom of your screen, which you can, uh, which you can initiate. Over to you, uh, Suzuki Sa. Thank you. Yeah. これ席の皆様方、日銀国交樹立70周年にあたり鈴木グループを代表して心より喜び申し上げます。皆様方より研究いただいておりますとおり、国交樹立以来 
日印鑑の交流はさまざまな分野で着実に進化しております。特にコロナ禍により中断しておりますが、両国首脳による相互訪問も定着しており、これは両国のパートナーシップの重要性を如実に表している一例と理解しております。さて、私ども鈴木グループは40年前にインドに進出しいたしました。私どものマルチス鈴記者はインドの国民の皆様のモビリティライフの充実と経済発展に貢献できるようインドの取引先様と協力し部品の現状化率を高め品質の高い価値ある四輪車の提供に努めてまいりました幸いにもインドの国民の皆様方に支えられマルチ鈴木社は今日の成長を遂げることができましたただ、ここで付け加えさせていただきたいのは、長きにわたり私どもがインドで事業を継続することができたのは、鈴木大使閣下からもございました通り、インド政府による安定的、経済的な産業振興政策による賜物であるという点でございます。改めまして、インド政府からのご支援に感謝申し上げます。さらに近年、メイクインインディアのスローガンのもと、製造業の育成と輸出の促進に積極的な姿勢を示すインド政府の施策に、私どもは非常に勇気づけられております。インド進出当初、ハリアナ州の工場生産能力は10万台規模でした。その後、ハリアナ州での第二生産拠点の設置に加え、輸出の拡大も視野に、グジャラート州に新工場を建設し、四輪車の生産能力は225万台までに拡大することができました。特筆すべきは、この成長過程において、部品の国産化と生産性は大幅に引き上げられ、品質、コストにおいて、インド製車両の競争力はグローバル市場で十分通用するレベルにまで高められたという点です。マルチ鈴木社の累計輸出台数は200万台を超え、2021年歴年では初めて20万台を超える四輪車をインドから輸出することができました。これはインド政府が標榜するメイクインインディアの一つの成功例と言えるでしょう、言えるのではないでしょうか。一方、足元ではインド国外から供給される半導体不足により生産活動が制約されるという課題に直面しております。インドで半導体を調達するという構想についてはインド政府が打ち出しております自立したインドという方針を支援していきたいと考えております。ご来場の皆様、この場をお借りして、先日発表された2022年から23年度のインド連邦政府予算についても簡単に触れさせていただきたいと思います。新年度予算では、私ども製造業が望んでいるインフラ整備への積極的な支出が盛り込まれていると同時に、長期にわたる政策の安定性や予見性が示されております。良好な投資環境のもと、私ども鈴木グループは、インドにおけるさらなる事業の拡大や、カーボンゼロ、循環型社会への投資についても積極的に進めてまいります。最後になりますが、鈴木グループは、経済発展を続けるインドにおいて、お客様から必要とされるモビリティの多様な選択肢の提供と、サステナビリティを両立させ、社会に貢献し続けることを目指してまいります。本日はありがとうございました。
Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzuki san. Thank you for uh, thank you for your remarks and thank you for uh, I think giving us this clear direction of uh, what it will take to build on the success, the great success that Suzuki has had uh, in India. Um, my uh, last panelist is uh, my friend Banmali Agrawal, uh, the president of Tata Sons. Uh, over to you, Banmali. Thank you so much, Nashad. Um, and I'll, I'll be brief in the interest of time and also because I think all the relevance points have already been made. So there's frankly nothing substantially more that I have to add. But let me just start by saying that I remember the last session that we had, uh, once again, we had tremendous amount of enthusiasm, uh, desire and keenness to work. And I think the, the entire atmosphere was all of how do we now get things moving. So the, fir the first point I'd like to make therefore is that I think it is time we begin to get things moving and move from a discussion stage to an action stage. And I think as far as action stages is, is concerned, I would say maybe we could even look at that in two phases. One is something in the short term so that we can have some success and then we can build on that success further. I think that will inspire a lot of confidence all around. Nosha did share with us certain trade figures and so on. And I clearly agree with him that given the, 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 the rest of the understanding uh, and the dynamic between the two countries, uh, I think the opportunity is far, far greater. Now, I would therefore suggest that maybe we pick a few areas to focus on in which we together can make substantial difference, not just to, just to the, for the two of our countries, but in fact for the world. And I'll just explain why I say that. The first sector clearly is the auto sector. We just heard uh, from, from Mr. Suzuki what a phenomenal job Suzuki's done in, 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 the, in the country and in the world. We are all well aware of the success of the Japanese auto uh, sector again in the world. We are also aware that within India, more than 60% of all manufacturing is directly or indirectly linked to the auto sector. We also know that India is on, embarked on this path of uh, kind of developing the auto industry in a sustainable manner, meaning electric vehicles and the substantial foray that one is making into that and so on and so forth. And why could, can this not be an area for the two countries to collaborate and to work together in? And by that, I mean that if our interests are going to be strategic, then I think we need to align ourselves with respect to objectives, with respect to standards, with respect to the approaches that we take to achieve a certain objective. I think we might be dissipating our energies by, by focusing on electric vehicles and also on hybrids and also on other technologies. I think the number of vehicles that are gonna be produced uh, in this part of the world, particularly in India, in terms of number, I think are going to far outweigh or outnumber any other production of automobiles in the world. That is, the, that is what the potential of the future is. I think we need to understand that, embrace that, and if it is strategic, form a certain commonality of interest around the areas that I mentioned. That would mean being strategically aligned to me versus being tactically aligned of just kind of, you know, making uh, the simple things work in the interest of, of both the companies. I would also connect or extend that whole thing on the auto sector to the issue of semiconductor chips that Mr. Suzuki very rightly mentioned. I think the entire supply chain in the auto sector is set for a complete overhaul. Today, I would argue that the supply chain in the auto sector is broken, it is too fragmented, and it is set for an overhaul. I do believe that between India and Japan, we can completely reconfigure the supply chain and be a, a stellar example for the world, and in fact, be a supplier to the world based on maybe a new platform on which we can build a sustainable, uh, uh, let's say, auto offering for, for, the, uh, for the world. And I'm specifically now talking about passenger vehicles, which, are, which is a huge opportunity. The second point I'd make in this connection is on green ammonia. And I heard our ambassador speak about it. 
I think uh, we all are aware of the challenges on energy and environment. Um, I think India has a phenomenal opportunity. Uh, we have the new hydrogen agenda that has been set forward by the government, using green hydrogen to convert to ammonia, and then kind of using that as a green form of energy, I think is a win-win in many respect. My understanding is that there are many Japanese uh, consumers, large consumers of energy who are, as we speak, willing to contract with Indian partners to source that ammonia from India that is made in a green way. Just imagine a new paradigm of energy collaboration whereby India almost becomes an exporter of energy from being an importer of energy on the back of hydrogen and ammonia. And given the need that Japan has, I think it again gets to be a good win. We can top it up with some phenomenal technology from Japan in terms of converting, first producing hydrogen and then converting the hydrogen into ammonia. It again gets to be a win-win, dramatically different solution for the world coming from India and Japan. The last, and I know that the list of items where we can collaborate and is, is, is extremely long, which has been articulated. I, I just would suggest that we choose a few maybe these two or whatever else that you might, might feel is, is worth it. But we just choose a few and focus on it and get it done, both for the short term as well as for the long term. The last point I'd make is around skilling, which was also made. Let's take the high-speed rail, pro high rail project, which is, or the Shinkansen project, which is under execution in the country. It's the highest form of technology that I think India would be seeing um, for, for, for a long time. Now, it is critical that the technology being utilized there is also transferred and is made available to the people within the Indian, uh, in the Indian context. The, the people in India need to be skilled in terms of using it, applying it, and so on. And the advantage from a Japanese perspective is that the Shinkansen technology, the way it is today, is frankly way too expensive for many other countries in the world to absorb and accept. Here again, I think is a classic opportunity for the two countries to come together, come out with a solution that solves the world's problems in a manner that benefits both India and Japan. I'm just going to stop there to, to re-emphasize my point. Let's select a few areas where we can collaborate to make a difference to the world and really show the power of Indo-US uh, opportunity and, and future. Thank you, Nosha. Thank you very much, Padmali. Thank you for those. Uh, thank you for those comments and the direction that they provide. Uh, what you know, in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is to uh, restrict us to one question for each panelist, and I'll go in reverse order, if I may. Um, so uh, I'd like to start actually with uh, with you, Padmali, um, and uh, you know your your thoughts on uh, finding one or two areas and starting. Uh, I think are very powerful. Um, and you mentioned green ammonia as an area of, of potential collaboration, uh, which sounds very intriguing. But I wanted to ask you also about two other areas. And these two other areas are semiconductors where the Tata Group has recently announced a major commitment. Uh, it's an area where Japan has great depth of experience across many, many companies. It's uh, was long one of the world leaders in semiconductor manufacturing. Um, and the second area being rare earths, um, where again, there is a real desire in the quad uh, more widely uh, to diversify sourcing of rare earths and processing of rare earths away from China. And I wondered if you could comment on those two areas of semiconductors and rare earths, and would they be, would they be in your candidate list for um, uh, for some major engagement between Japan and India. So, Noshad, again, I think you, you've picked on uh, exactly the right subject, uh, the right topics. Uh, and, and let me take semiconductors first. Uh, I think maybe we need to have another session just to, to make the point that semiconductor is a very wide spectrum of what chips are. I mean, you have semiconductor chips and chips, they're of different shapes and sizes meant for different applications. And I think it would be difficult to kind of try and embrace the entire spectrum 
of, of, that, of that space. I think we, again, within that space, we would need to be selective. And that's the reason why I kind of connected the semiconductor chips with the auto sector. I think ultimately, whatever we do, whatever we do, I think needs to connect to a certain demand or consumption or application, which is tangible. So semiconductors, absolutely yes, but for what particular end use, if you can fine tune that, and then we stay focused on it, I think there is absolutely clearly a win-win. Incidentally, Noshad, uh, over the last few days, I've been having some discussions with, with uh, 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 certain partners in Japan who want to start a research project on the very high end of semiconductors of including three nanometers and six nanometers and what have you, which is a longish term project, but that would be the long-term strategy rather than again, depend, being dependent on certain other parts of the world you know, for, for cutting edge uh, technology for the future. So the short answer to your question in semiconductors, absolutely, but make that agenda even sharper and, and more defined. Otherwise, I think it gets a little yeah. diffused. On rare earths, uh, the, 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 the same point, Noshad, I, I must admit I'm not as familiar with rare earths and what exactly the, the opportunity, uh, you know, what's the dose of technology that we could use over there to make it, uh, to make it let's say, beneficial for both sides. But I, I see the point you're making that how do we de-risk ourselves from the otherwise known sources of rare earths and, and kind of uh, be self-reliant. So uh, I would argue that that too would be a very interesting area to work on. Thank you, Vanwali. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to go to uh, Suzuki-san. Um, you know, one of the one of the areas mentioned was uh, electric vehicles, um, and uh, there is this huge need for uh, vehicles as in general, as Banwali pointed out in his comments earlier on, and in moving in the direction of electric vehicles over time. And I wondered, you know, how can India and Japan collaborate uh, to? to reach a position of leadership in electric vehicles uh, going forward. Um, because there are probably what we can do together um, will take us further than what we can do uh, on our own. Hi. あの、将来に向けて、将来はですね、あの、EV電動化、フルEVっていうところが、あの、え、EV化に向かっていくというようなところが、あの、ステップとして踏んでいくことが必要かなというふうに思ってますし、あの、EVになった場合についてですね、考えるとやはり え、Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Suzuki san. Thank you for those comments. Um, I'd like to go to, to Rajan and pick up on something that you mentioned, Rajan, about the gaming industry uh, in Japan and India. And it was a striking, uh, a striking fact. I think you said that. Uh, India has the world's largest number of uh, gamers um, and Japan has the world's highest revenue per gamer. Um, and if we combine that, you know, if we say, how do we go from 
I don't know what is it, hi highest eyeballs and fingers or something uh, to uh, uh, combine with uh, the highest revenue per eyeball and finger um, to how does that, what can we do together uh, to really, really build a world competitive industry? Uh, because as you mentioned also, I think we still account for a fairly small share of total world gaming revenues. So how can we, how can we address that um, very directly collaboratively as opposed to again, uh, something that we would each do individually? No, thanks, thanks, Naushad. You know, and, and you know, this was indicative of one area, you know, where we are definitely, we are working ourselves, right? So what we did first was we sent about 50 of our uh, people from India to Japan to actually work in the Japanese ecosystem with our strengthened partners. So basically start, started out with particularly on a very strong B2B relationship where we, we understood this strategic uh, opportunity that exists between you know, companies in India, talent that India has, understanding of the India market that companies like ours have, and the strength of the Japanese companies with relations to that. So actually, you know, it starts initially with the cultural adaptation and particularly when you come to engineering talent, you come to, you know, deep creative talent, you know, right from communication to strengthening the bridges to really understanding what has driven, you know, this entire change. And, and it's interesting because when you talk of, you know, consumer spending, it's, it's, it's got a lot of factors that, that come in, right? It's got, you know, uh, uh, not only the ability for consumers to spend, it's got, you know, uh, technologies like AI, which, which throw out the opportunity at the right time. You know, it's got uh, an, you know, a, a, a deeper understanding of what drives particular kind of spends and what are the outcomes that, you know, that, that excite people around that. So to me, it is really a very strong example of, of a people to people partnership under an umbrella of a, of a business to business uh, kind of a, you know, bridge where the businesses are really looking at each other uh, from this complementarity you know, angle. And what we've really been able to do well is because if you look at the Japanese gaming industry, right, the Japanese gaming industry has not really been able to penetrate into Western markets either very effectively. Given that, you know, Japan is the third largest gaming industry in the world, uh, a large part of Japanese content creation and consumption is happening within Japan, right? There's also, um, you know, there is a deficiency in talent uh, pool itself, but also the language in which, and, you know, the art styles, et cetera, that drive it. So we've had these two or three partnerships with uh, three multi-billion dollar, you know, companies from Japan, Square Enix, you know, GRI and Konami and others, where we are really building and bridging those gaps uh, to see how we take that same Japanese content, the technology that comes together and, and see how that can get deployed in India with the Indian, uh, you know, kind of uh, sensibilities Maybe it's cricket, you know, and other areas uh, which are more relevant uh, to, to Indian uh, gamers. But at the same time, you know, exploring global uh, opportunities to, to penetrate into, you know, Western markets. Uh, and, you know, just to, I just correct that India will grow to be the largest, uh, you know, uh, base. China today is the largest, you know, gamer base, uh, you know, at an, at an overall level. Uh, but even if we do look at, you know, the U.S., Western markets, Japan, uh, Korea and other countries, the opportunity is, 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 is very large for this collaboration. So that's, and, 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 I, and I think it brings, you know, a creative industries and technology industries together. So I think also thinking about interdisciplinary, you know, kind of uh, skill sets that can create value. And that's why I mentioned the metaverse, you know, where the virtual world is going to really recreate the real world as the as the players in these industries wanted to shape up. And, and, and you'll be surprised at what we might see, you know, a decade or two decades down the road. So exciting times, but therefore a lot of opportunity. Thank you, Rajan. Thank you. Um, last, let me come to Murayama San. And Murayama San, I should mention first that there have been several comments in the chat asking for a copy of your uh, of your remarks earlier on, because I think uh, people felt that they were so valuable and so rich that they would like to have them 
um, uh, so so we will be we'll be in touch separately on uh, on, on that. But my, 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 but my question to you, Maria Masan, is really around the comment that you made that uh, you know that India is 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 one of the five uh, markets of greatest interest to Japanese industry in surveys. The second, the second, uh, the second most you mentioned, I think. Um, if you look at the other four, if you look at China, uh, Vietnam, the U.S., Thailand. Um, what is it that attracts Japanese companies? And if you look at what attracts Japanese companies to be such major investors, uh, you know, if you go around Vietnam, you go around Thailand, you go around the Philippines, um, you see the presence of hundreds and hundreds of Japanese companies uh, in many, many different sectors. Um, what would need to be different to see that same kind of pattern happen in India? Uh, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we uh, repeat uh, the wonderful Suzuki success story in India uh, for many more Japanese companies? Uh, it's a broad question, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in my personal view, the, the economy of uh, Southeast Asian countries like Thailand, Vietnam, or Indonesia, and those where the Japanese investment was instrumental for their industrial development is very different from what India has developed. So I would say that the India would never want to be a sort of a, a sub, sort of getting some contract from Japan. And uh, what we expect or uh, what we see in India is more of a different path of or different channel of, of uh, friendship or partnership. So uh, it, it, India does not have to follow what Mm -hmm. uh, Thailand, Southeast Asian said, but uh, as uh, Mr. Agarwal said, that uh, it is the shortest way is to make uh, sort of success cases, and alignment is very, very uh, uh, important. I see, although that we use the same terminology like uh, transformation, uh, digital time for, uh, transformation, or uh, global value chain resilience. Uh, what we expect or what we dream from the world from the wars is always a bit different. So we have to talk more and more and to find a place of agreement. And based on that, uh, as he said that we should make a success story and that will become a sort of a showcase for other uh, in Japanese partners or India partners can follow. That's what I feel. Thank you, Muran san And I'm, I'm going to end uh, our session uh, on that note. Uh, and coming back to Banmali's uh, Banmali's suggestion to us that uh, what we need are specific areas of work uh, where some in the short run that give us some short run wins that can then inspire that much more work while we while we pursue some longer term points and some longer term development uh, collaborations. Uh, and I think as we move in that direction, it can be very powerful in truly invigorating the economic partnership between India and Japan. But thank you all as uh, panelists. Thank you, you've been a wonderful panel. I wish we had, we had more time for um, going much further, uh, but I know we're way out of time. So uh, thank you again and uh, over to you Indrani. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Naushad, and uh, uh, thank you, panelists, for such a wonderful session. Uh, it actually takes the whole economic uh, relationship forward uh, when we were, we are actually looking at opportunities. And uh, here in our uh, last session for the day, uh, we will look at uh, the big strategic uh, questions of the day, um, especially rooting the India-Japan relationship in the Indo-Pacific, which is now uh, literally the focus of geopolitics, uh, global geopolitics today. Um, for the speakers, for, for this session, I have a, an absolutely stellar panel um, uh, this morning. Um, I, I have Vice Admiral uh, Pradeep Chauhan, uh, Director General of the National Maritime Foundation, uh, Dr. C. Raja Mohan, uh, Senior Fellow at the Asia Society Policy Institute, uh, Professor Tom Taniguchi, uh, Professor Keio University, and uh, Special Advisor.
to former Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe and Professor Hideshi Tokuchi, uh, President of the Research Institute of Peace and Security um, in Japan. Uh, thank you all for being here and uh, none of you need any uh, introduction to our viewers and our audience, but I will um, begin by, um, actually Raja Mohan, I will begin with uh, Raj today because uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, may be the, uh, the focus of global geopolitics, but today we are confronted with a completely new um, secure, international security and strategic situation uh, in the Russia-Ukraine theater. Uh, given that the President Putin has already has declared war on Ukraine, how do you believe that might uh, affect the future of Indo-Pacific? How do you believe that might affect uh, uh, the the key relationships that govern the Indo-Pacific theater? Professor Rajamohan. Thank you. Thank you, Indrani. Uh, delighted to be part of this panel. Uh, those of you, I'm sure all of us are sitting in the conference room, but when you get out and watch your TV screens, um, you'll see live coverage of the Russian military operation. Uh, in Eastern Ukraine. And uh, Russia has started something which could be one of the most consequential military conflicts in Europe. And what happens in Europe uh, does not stay in Europe, and it is bound to affect those of us in the, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, in fact, it is, it is really to the credit of the Japanese leadership, uh, particularly Pabe-san, who really invented the concept of Indo-Pacific in a modern time, uh, gave it traction, uh, lobbied for it, reached out for it, uh, and reached out the, for the rest of the world to accept the notion. And today, it is, we've seen that become a stable, accepted uh, notion. But what's happening in Ukraine now, and what it does to European geopolitics, uh, is going to create a significant problems uh, for us in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, there is no doubt that the Russia has overreached and uh, has created a situation uh, that is going to uh, make it very, very hard for India and Japan, which have actually, through the last decade and more, uh, have reached out to Russia in the hope that Russia would play an independent role in the security of the Indo-Pacific. That Russia would act as a, as, a, as a force of stabilization. But today, by provoking or triggering a conflict uh, in Europe, uh, it unleashes a train of events uh, that are going to make it much harder for us uh, in, in the region to, to, to secure this region. So both our own bilateral policies of the special effort we made with Russia uh, is going to get more complicated. Uh, far more consequentially, I think the war in Ukraine will bound to empower China and distract America. Now, how far this will go, I mean, it's open for debate. Everybody can say what they want. But the fact is, uh, that a, a conflict in Europe, the Chinese are pretty gleeful. And in fact, if you see them the last two days, essentially telling Russia, go ahead and do what you want, uh, but also reaching out to the Americans and saying, in fact, all of you know, this is the week uh, President Nixon went to China 50 years ago. Uh, and the yesterday's statement from Beijing is that, look, we must keep up the spirit of uh, Mao Zedong and Nixon alive. That is, there is still room for a US-Russia engagement. So the Chinese, uh, what what uh, Chinese have done is to look the Russian, sorry, what the Russians have done is to make Chinese look genius, and put China in a pole position, not only between Russia and the West, but also in the Indo-Pacific. Therefore, and the U.S. Uh, whether it really when walk and chew gum or not, we can debate that. But the fact is, the, the Europe is going to suck some of the bandwidth that Biden administration was hoping to devote to the to the Indo-Pacific. So my my basic point is. As the conflict unfolds in Europe, India and Japan must take greater burdens for security in the Indo-Pacific. The, so far, it is the Americans who are leading the debate uh, in the last few years. And for us, they were setting the agenda. But now I think it is time for Delhi and Tokyo to take a fresh look at the region. And that we should be able to pick up a lot more of the slack for regional security, uh, which means strengthening our own bilateral security relationship strengthening our partnerships in the region and doing more uh, to help weaker countries in this part of the world. This requires a far more sweeping, far more ambitious agenda on the security cooperation than India and Japan have been willing to devote so far. Uh, Japan has its own uh, constraints and India 
has its own. But now, if you take a fresh look at the consequences of what's happening in Europe or Asia, I think we need a bolder vision for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific on the security issue. I think, Indrani, I'll stop here, but maybe come back on other issues later. Uh, thank you, Raj. Uh, well said, and uh, glad you placed the agenda in the current uh, in current global uh, situation. Uh, Professor uh, Tom Taniguchi, I, may I continue uh, uh, in this vein with you? I know that you have actually you were not only part of uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, brain trust when it came to uh, both the Indo-Pacific and the Quad and the, the future of the bilateral relationship with India. If you could put that thinking cap back on and uh, look at where, what is the future? What Raj, Raj put out a certain set of uh, uh, actions that we should take between India and Japan. Where do you think the two countries can proceed both grounded in the Indo-Pacific as well as in the bilateral context. You're on mute. You're on mute, uh, Tom. All right. Uh, thank you, Indrani. Uh, and uh, as you say, time is ripe for us to speak not only of the genesis of our most amicable bilateral relationship, but also more of our shared future. True, as someone who has closely worked with Shinzo Abe, uh, pride fills my heart whenever I look back at the past 15 years and reflect on how close he has brought Japan to India. Without heart-to-heart, spirit-to-spirit ties, Prime Minister Abe developed first with Mamohan Singh and second even more with Narendra Modi. Could the FOIP concept or quad have taken shape as they actually have, I sometimes doubt. And yet now, let us shift our focus from what has happened to what we should accomplish over the coming decade, a decade that is so much formative against the backdrop of the region's changing dynamics for our shared peace and prosperity. In thinking of what to be done let us shoot for the moon and do so quite literally. In fact, it is not a moonshot project any longer. It is happening now. Within the next two to three years, Indo-Japanese lunar exploration project will reach the South Pole area of the moon. The rover system that roves in one of those permanently shadowed craters in search of water ice is being developed by Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, while the lander system that must make a pinpoint landing by the Indian Space Research Organization, or ISRO. I should suggest that both of our two prime ministers should highlight when they will meet in person next month in India, the significance of that ice-breaking project to showcase to the rest of the world that on the cutting edge technolo technological development, India and Japan run on the same edge. My second suggestion for a shared future is that India must develop a habit of mind of thinking Japan first, and Japan vice versa, in planning anything scientifically groundbreaking, which may range from quantum computing, advanced medicine to game changers in military technologies. To facilitate such cooperation in technological development, it is better than otherwise than that India and Japan are treaty bound. What kind of MOUs or treaties are thinkable is what I would like Ambassador Suzuki to ponder and do so most ambitiously. My third suggestion may be somehow provocative. In the coming decade, India is most likely to see more intens intensified provocations from China over its northern border areas, while Japan over the Senkakus and indeed toward Taiwan, our democratic linchpin, the loss of which should dramatically alter the security landscape 
throughout the Indo-Pacific region. The leaders of both of our countries, I mean top leaders, must start getting prepared for the Chinese assault on either one of us or both of us and emotionally committed to what kind of responses they should take in case of real contingencies, what to be expected and what not to be expected, what value India could give to Japan and Japan vice versa to India must be among the scenarios they must be equipped with and constantly able to update. That is worth doing because we're no longer just friends. We are partners and as partners, we must always dance along with the same tune, especially in times of dire crisis like today, the day of Russian invasion into Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and you're absolutely right. We do have, we have an agenda that should be much, much broader, much deeper than what we have today. Uh, and with this ambition, may I call on Admiral Chauhan to look at Indo-Pacific from its core, which is, the, which is maritime security and uh, other maritime area cooperation that the uh, India and Japan would be part of, whether uh, with the Quad or bilaterally. Admiral Chauhan. Thank you very much, Indrani. And let me say thank you for the opportunity to share some views uh, in quite so distinguished a panel. Uh, let me start by uh, addressing one um, overarching uh, point, and that is that India's grand strategy, uh, India's military strategy, and India's maritime strategy are all being increasingly contextualized to the Indo-Pacific. And uh, as uh, Taniguchi-san just said, uh, we are not anymore uh, just friends with Japan. We are now uh, partners and strategic partners. And uh, not only is there the strategic partnership, which is rapidly replacing the Cold War uh, system of alliances, but uh, today there is a hierarchy of uh, strategic partnerships. So we have strategic partnerships and special strategic partnerships and comprehensive strategic partnerships and strategic and global partnerships. And uh, well, I suppose we have comprehensive global strategic partnership as well as the APEC level. But Japan and India stand at very nearly the apex themselves as strategic and global partners. And yet, if this rhetoric is to be translated into uh, actual um, uh, implementation or implementable issues, we need to actually give uh, substance to these lofty sorts of, uh, comments. Uh, India, of course, is currently concentrating upon two multilateral uh, structures uh, for its whole approach to constructive engagement within the Indo-Pacific. The first being the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, and of course, uh, the second being the Quad. And in the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, we already have Japan who has willingly uh, joined us in taking the lead in terms of trade connectivity, maritime transport, in fact, all forms of maritime connectivity. So uh, if I was to uh, jump from there into a more specific area, uh, but first, uh, examine um, the Indo-Pacific through the Japanese lens. And let me, let me preface my remarks also by saying that I entirely agree with Raja uh, in terms of the fact that European focus and to some, to some large extent, global focus will be sucked away from the Indo-Pacific into the, into the uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, imbroglio. And uh, I think that that will be to our detriment, but like all challenges, it has opportunities for India and Japan to take uh, a much more robust leadership uh, position and uh, to escape the rhetoric and replace it by some active, uh, meaningful engagement. So Japan, of course, is, uh, is, is continuing with its free and open Indo-Pacific policy, and it is largely driven by the need Japan to assure the security of energy. And this energy supply, uh, notwithstanding the efforts being made to switch to uh, EVs for the transport sector, but you know, all transport sectors uh, moving to EV will cause a massive demand in cobalt. And we all know that cobalt is unavailable in most parts of the world, barring the Democratic Republic of Congo. And that will then lead 
to a geopolitical race uh, for some segments of uh, that particular uh, country. And uh, the corridors that uh, Japan has established in terms of the East Africa Northern Corridor centered upon Kenya, the, the Nakala Corridor centered upon Mozambique, and even the uh, Bay of Bengal uh, Industrial Growth uh, Belt or the Big B. These are, these are uh, areas in which India should be jumping blindfolded if necessary. Uh, and it is, uh, or, or we will see another repeat of this very tragic situation in which, uh, you know, the, 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 B, the, the G to G relationship in terms of the, in, uh, in terms of the Asia Africa growth corridor has practically been uh, given up and uh, we are now reduced to a B to B. So let me finish with my uh, last couple of points, uh, uh, recognizing the paucity of time. At the strategic level, how should we cooperate? What should we actually do? The first, I think, is we should be shaping views in, uh, in ASEAN vis-a-vis -vis lawfare. Uh, it, you know, this whole business of how are we going to handle uh, issues which Chinese uh, scholars and Chinese analysts and Chinese uh, military people throw up in terms of lawfare, saying that, why are you blaming us? What about Okino Torishima? What about uh, these various other um, uh, um, options that exist? I don't, I'm not trying to find justification. I am trying to find a common area. What would be, what should be our approach when, when this question is raised? What from which sheet of music should, should uh, Japan and India sing in harmony? What about uh, an area of uh, ballistic missile defense, especially the space-based segment? Yesterday, there was a very good comment which was made by uh, one of the US leading interlocutors in a different forum when he said that India needs to figure out with Japan how we are going to divorce ourselves from just the space-based segment, which is easily jammable, to a drone intensive uh, area of strategic cooperation for intelligence sharing and for specific technologies, uh, directed energy, uh, laser-based movement, movement away from uh, simply explosive ordnance to kinetic energy, and from there to directed energy. What should we do together? What have we done together in terms of rail guns, extended range ammunition, pixel-based stabilization, uh, electric energy storage supplies, stealth. These are all strategic level issues. And I rather think that we cannot, India cannot sit a cross-legged upon some corner with a PL-480 equivalent bowl and give us some technology. No, we need to be able to do this together. And that means that we both have to invest in our respective personnel. Cascading down to the operational level, I think that uh, the, the options here are really uh, exciting. And they include issues such as uh, how do we how do we manage to uh, jointly detect Chinese uh, nuclear powered submarines as they enter the Indian Ocean? What should we do? Should it be trilateral between the USA, Japan, and India? I rather think that that will be necessary. And then, what would Japan's contribution and India's contribution actually pan out to be? If we cannot detect uh, these areas, and we cannot exploit these areas, we cannot move forward, then I'm afraid Japan and China and India will both be subjected to um, the same geopolitical constriction as is currently evident in much of Europe. Last point is this, that when you know China keeps wailing about uh, the Malacca dilemma, I often wonder, why don't we hear Japan talking about the Malacca dilemma? Why don't we hear uh, South Korea talking about the Malacca dilemma. Why don't, even, why don't we even hear Australia talk about the Malacca dilemma because much of their product does go through that particular strait or set of straits. In each of these, there are large areas of cooperation which are possible and both nations need to remove the stops that have present, have, have up to now prevented them from moving much um, much more robustly together uh, and actually do that robust movement I, I, up there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral John. Uh, you've given uh, the session a lot to pon ponder on and a lot to uh, talk about. Uh, may I now call upon uh, Tokushi san for uh, your remarks? Uh, we, we've spoken about uh, 
uh, the Indo-Pacific, Indo -Pacific, we've spoken about a bilateral relation, but we haven't actually focused so much on the Quad. Um, in your view, uh, what, should, what is the future of the Quad as you see it? Well, um, oh, oh, by the way, uh, thank you, Indrani. Uh, first of all, uh, let me congratulate uh, the 70th anniversary of the uh, diplomatic relations between the two countries. And also let me thank uh, the organizers, uh, the Ananta Center, and the governments of both countries for having me in this very important event. Well, um, in my view, uh, the Quad is growing. Originally, it was a, uh, just a, a mechanism for coordination uh, among the uh, senior diplomats of the four countries. Um, but now, uh, the uh, several uh, meetings of the foreign ministers level and also the uh, uh, leaders level uh, were held. And uh, originally there were no unified joint statements uh, uh, as uh, the result of uh, each session of uh, the court. But now we have uh, uh, a couple of uh, leaders level joint statement and also uh, in the aftermath of the uh, latest uh, foreign ministers uh, level uh, quote, uh, there uh, emerged a uh, joint statement for the first time in the life of the quote. So it's growing. Um, the, as uh, the quote is a group of maritime democracies in the Indo-Pacific, uh, the uh, it is very important to keep uh, the present momentum. Uh, the principle, and at the same time, the principles that the quads, uh, Quad is trying to uh, pursue uh, cannot be achieved by the efforts of uh, the four countries alone, uh, like such as uh, the rule of law uh, or a free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, so uh, the, we need uh, two things. Uh, first, uh, the Quad should be uh, more operationalized, uh, even with regional and extra regional uh, partners. Uh, for example, Malabar exercise uh, is uh, meaningful so as to retrieve balance of power uh, uh, in our advantage. And also La Perouse uh, naval exercise uh, with France was also uh, meaningful. Uh, capitalizing on the uh, growing European engagement in the Indo-Pacific region, naval and maritime law enforcement cooperation uh, should be enhanced. The military establishment of the two nations, particularly the navies, should demonstrate their initiative uh, in the enhanced operationalization of the quote. And uh, also in doing so, uh, both countries uh, should uh, emphasize the importance of a whole of government approach uh, in order to counter China's gray zone and hybrid warfare, uh, unity of efforts of particularly of the Navy and uh, actually the both navies and the uh, Coast Guards is critical. Uh, China Coast Guard has become a, a military organization with uh, maritime law enforcement uh, missions. Stovepiped approach uh, on our side will not work against the formidable adversary. And also, uh, I would argue for the institutionalization of, of the court. Uh, the, the joint declarations in the leaders level and in the foreign minister level a uh, good development uh, in a declaratory policy. Uh, in order to uh, turn such diplomatic uh, statements into real actions, the four countries should establish a well-organized uh, secretariat, including uh, military and law enforcement uh, officers. And India and Japan uh, will be able to show uh, their initiative, I think. However, uh, 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 we have to be careful about the following two points. First of all, the Quad is not an alliance. O all of us know that India is an uh, autonomous country. Uh, we have to 
uh, respect uh, India's position as well. And at the same time, if we look back at the history of the quad, the origin is, as we all know, uh, the uh, tsunami and earthquake of uh, 2004. And the uh, coordination group, uh, core group of the coordination was the origin of the quad. But uh, the quad uh, uh, was not, quad itself uh, was not born immediately after the disaster relief efforts. It took long, long years uh, in order to uh, formulate uh, uh, the present uh, format of the code. So uh, it uh, require uh, political energy. So we have to keep uh, this, we have to keep the efforts to uh, go forward with the current uh, momentum. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Takuchi san. Uh, you have spoken about uh, institutionalizing the Quad in a, with the Secretariat um, as well as a military uh, agreement. Uh, I think where I think where we are right now, the it is the four countries, at least the four leaderships, from what we gathered, are still getting into the space of cooperation of making a habit of cooperation between these four countries. So I, I guess where we we will, because I, I think from the Indian perspective, you know, there have been uh, uh, groupings where the secretariat has come before uh, political uh, sort of alignment, shall we speak, or convergence. Um, so I, I think that is, I think that is certainly uh, something that we have to take it forward, especially where um, the question that, and I will ask you this question, where, when, if we institutionalize the quad, um, where do you see bilateral or trilateral agreements within the quad taking place? And how does that happen? And Tokuchi san, I will come to that come with that question to you later. Uh, right now, I can see, I know that in the interest of time, we I will ask some of the questions that have been put on the chat box. Uh, let me go to um, uh, Tom. Tom, let me go to you. You may have answered part of this, but uh, there is a question for you that says, do you see India militarily intervening in the South China Sea, Taiwan, Senkaku conflict? Uh, and would Japan militarily intervene in the Indian Ocean region? Should the freedom of the seas be contested by other non-benign powers? Is, do you see a grounds for a new Japan-India security framework agreement like the US-Japan agreement? Uh, Tom, if you would like to take that question. When it comes to ensuring free passage of commercial fleet, that uh, benefits every one of us. The seascape, the uh, sea lines of commerce are part of common goods for us to safeguard. And who else could better do that job than democratic maritime powers such as India and Japan? So there is no question when it comes to the need and importance of us working together to actually safeguard the sea lines of commerce. That's point number one. And to enrich Quad and to institutionalize, as Tokuchi-san mentioned, Quad thickness and density uh, between the member states uh, should benefit uh, for that purpose. The more uh, densely uh, knitted uh, ties between India and Japan, in all domains from outer space, space, cyber, air, water, whatever, uh, must be very good uh, for that purpose. So there is no conflict between the thickening and uh, intensifying bilateral, trilateral relationships with uh, the Quad. Uh, thank you. Uh, Admiral Chauhan, I, I would, like to take you up on, on your own remarks where you spoke about uh, the four countries or at least India, Japan, maybe Australia, uh, maybe South Korea coming together to 
cooperate on what you call the Malacca dilemma. And if, if that is the space where uh, we must all be uh, aligning together or converging together with our interests, with our actions, how do you see that operationalizing on the ground? What are the ideas that you would have uh, for that? First of all, I think that uh, the un understanding of the Malacca dilemma is now fairly um, in the sense that Malacca dilemma doesn't refer to the state of Malacca alone, but it refers to the movement of critical energy supplies to any of the choke points, which include Malacca, Sunda, Lombok, uh, and also, I dare say, include uh, Babel, Mandeb, and Hormuz on the other side. They're all part of the same dilemma because the sources are at one end and the destination points are at the other, barring the case with India. So one option, I think, which is easily uh, doable, even though it requires a bit of out of the box thinking, is what if I told, what if we were to tell Japan, you constant, even if even if we're not yet in a position to actually form a formal kind of uh, alliance of the kind that you uh, suggested in your question earlier, but if we were to say that hi, you look after your interests in the uh, East China Sea, the Shunchao. Uh, gas fields or the Diaoyu, Senkaku Island problem, and we will concern ourselves with ensuring safety of uh, Japanese sea lines of communication and the energy trade that flows upon them uh, on the western side of the uh, of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, because don't forget that this whole thing in our construct at least uh, remains the Indo-Pacific. That then will force a, uh, a, a, a collaborative move because even in the even in the South China Sea, Indrani, uh, India has a has twenty five percent of its uh, of its trade flowing through those waters. And so, if we react correctly to one hundred ten billion dollars worth of trade in the Strait of Babel Mandeb, surely we should be reacting to one hundred eighty billion dollars worth of trade of India uh, passing through this uh, through the South China Sea. And if Japan will take on some of that burden. We take on some of Japan's burden in the Western Arabian Sea or in the Western uh, in, in the Indian Ocean or the Western segment of the Indo-Pacific. I think that, that is an operationalization of a plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tokuchi san, would you like to take that uh, the question that I asked you? Oh, yes. Uh, I have several points. Uh, first of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about maritime security. The sea is one. Therefore, the rule that governs the sea must be one as well. So uh, the, uh, the quote uh, as a group of maritime democracies should make utmost efforts to uh, keep up uh, the principle of the rule of law. And in the, in the world uh, connected by the sea, there is no such thing as uh, maritime security just for the South China Sea, just for uh, the Indian Ocean, or just for the East uh, China Sea. So we have to uh, broaden our scope uh, in order to, uh, to achieve uh, maritime security as a whole. So a holistic approach is necessary. And uh, in order to uh, respond to your question, uh, I'd like to say uh, uh, one thing. Uh, both countries, I mean, India and Japan, um, have two important documents, although they are not treaties. Uh, one is um, a Joint Declaration on Security Cooperation of October 2008. And the second one is Tokyo Declaration uh, for Japan-India Special Strategic and Global Partnership of September 2014. And both documents are products of the age before the pandemic, uh, before uh, the rise of the uh, Indo-Pacific construct, before the inauguration of the two plus two ministerial between the two countries, before the ruling of the Permanent Court of Arbitration on the South China Sea dispute, and before ushering in the uh, strategic competition with China. And in particular, the joint declaration uh, on security cooperation of 2008 uh, was uh, established in the era of uh, global war on terrorism. Of course, we are not 
uh, free from the threat of international terrorism. But today's world is much different from those days. And so uh, in my view, by renewing these basic documents, both countries will be able to generate new momentum for going forward in security cooperation. Uh, thank you, Tokuchi san. If I may, uh, if I may digress a little bit from uh, the pure maritime security uh, space that we have all uh, occupied. The idea of Indo-Pacific, and this is for this question is for Tom. The idea of Indo-Pacific is also goes beyond uh, just maritime security. And in the during the pandemic, it says it in, it encompasses uh, critical technologies. It encompasses secure uh, or resilient uh, value chains. And India, Japan, and Australia, for instance, have the SCRI, which is um, on uh, on value chains and uh, resilient infrastructure. In your view, Tom Taniguchi, where what are the what are the threads that we should be picking up now? And I say this not merely in the context of the pandemic, from which we have not the world has not completely uh, got out, but also in the in the current geopolitical situation, given the fact that it actually. Uh, turns a lot of geopolitical equations uh, on their head, or at least has the potential to. So, dump your views. When Shinzo Abe spoke first of um, the confluence of the two seas, he meant that the previous geographic concept of Asia Pacific failed to include India which already promised to become even bigger economically, population-wise, than China in 20, 30 years time. It was a way for Japan to invest more into the future of India and hence into the shared future of India and Japan. Hence came the concept Indo-Pacific. It's an all encompassing concept and it's uh, purely, it's not purely about military uh, cooperation. Uh, it should embrace uh, many, many other fields. And what's missing in this uh, big picture, if I may uh, pick up one, is the human connection. I think uh, scientists of these two countries must cooperate more and uh, much, much more intensively. Uh, uh, university to university cooperation, that's been dwarfed uh, by other countries' attempts uh, toward India. So, um, it's, uh, it's once again for Japan to invest into the future of India. And lest uh, we forget, uh, China is looking at a momentous uh, benchmark year, 2049, the centenary year for the PRC. The next 27 years will be a, a, a great uh, period of um, uh, uh, a tumultuous um, uh, period and uh, uh, to, to, to weather that uh, uh, tumultuous period, I think it's uh, imperative for in India and Japan to work uh, much, much more together. Uh, thank you, Tom. Raj, uh, uh, Raj, there is a question for you, um, which you may be able to see in the, in the Q&A, but it says that uh, does the Russian intervention in Ukraine provide encouragement to China to reunite with Taiwan and to repossess Senkaku. But much more than that, uh, it, uh, I think if, if you could dwell a little bit on the kind of geopolitical shift that you foresee uh, in the context of the current crisis that is unfolding in Ukraine uh, and in Europe. And the, the, way in the, in the, way, the ways in which the Indo-Pacific, particularly India, Japan, um, Australia and the US will be impacted, uh, particularly in the way China can um, make hay in this the current geopolitical uh, situation, frankly, twice in one century. I mean, this is an opportunity of lifetime. But uh, Raj, your thoughts? Thanks, uh, thanks, Indrani. I mean, I think first the question, I mean, look, the popular narrative in the international press is Ukraine and Taiwan as the equivalent. But I think both, both Japan and India we should look at the, the basic argument Russia has made in, in Ukraine, which is 
So historic lands belong to Russia, and that it is Russia's right to take this over. And China has the same argument uh, on the Himalayas that it sees it as a claim of a certain type of territories, which is what they've tried to do in Ladakh, and that these belong to us. I mean, forget international law. In South China Sea, international law does not apply to that. And that this is the historic lands. So they're constructing a narrative very similar to Russia's, that they have historic grievances, the, you know, that these lands belong to them or these waters, these islands belong to them. Therefore, what is happening in Russia, in Europe today, uh, Russia, China would be far more empowered to actually push for, you know, establish, redeem its claims. You can argue whether the claims are right or wrong, but they have the power today. They will try and redeem those claims. That will put Japan and India in the direct fire of what China can do if the Sino-Russian alliance deepens and the US gets preoccupied. And Europe, we've been, again, it was Abe San who tried to draw Europeans into the Indo-Pacific. But a Europe that is going to be locked into a direct conflict on its own soil, that it will find it even harder to engage in the Indo-Pacific. So therefore, for us, there is a direct, immediate territorial challenge from what is happening in Ukraine, both to Japan and India and Philippines and a whole lot of others who have territorial disputes with China. Taiwan is a, is a, is a different question. Uh, that too could happen. But for us, let's focus on our own uh, territorial questions vis-a-vis -vis China. And I think that's number one situation. Second, I think that the longer term geopolitics I mean, is also going to affect economics. I mean, there was a lot of discussion of this issue that, for example, the oil prices are going to shoot up. And if Russia, I don't see this problem being resolved. If Russia is going to be under prolonged international sanctions, if the Russian strategy of disrupting many, you know, global economic uh, movements, uh, in, in, they could do it in Black Sea and they could do it in a variety of ways. But then it puts again China, one helping Russia to weather the power of the sanctions. And at the same time, offering its market and cooperation to Europe and others, look, there is a way to absorb, because Europe is going to pay a very high price for the sanctions on Russia because the interdependence in Europe is so, so deep. And will you tell the Europeans, can the Americans tell the Europeans, forego both your Russian market as well as the Chinese market? So this way, I think, again, I think it puts China in a powerful new position, thanks to our Russian friends. The Chinese leverage with Russia has dramatically improved because Russians have nowhere else to go. And the Chinese can present themselves as ones that can actually save the world at this point of time from preventing the global economy from being undermined by opening the market. I mean, I think you can see, as I mentioned earlier, constant appeal to the Western investors uh, to say, look, we can work together with the West. So that puts the Chinese once again in a, in a very powerful economic position. And the third uh, issue uh, that, that we need, I think, you know, Admiral Chauhan talked about it, if we accept the notion, we will have to take more responsibilities. I'm sure both Japan and India have done a lot more than the European countries have done to secure their own defense. But I think we need to go to the next level of actually translating the core proposition. One, we need to take more burden. And we need to share that burden. How we do it? Do we do it geographically? Do we do it through distribution of responsibilities? Do we do it through greater technology sharing? So I think all these questions must now be put on the table. Uh, the Japanese have constraints in terms of, you know, the US alliance, they've gone beyond that to Australia. India doesn't like alliances, but I think starting from first principles, we must define a new political strategic basis for India-Japan engagement. Doing merely on what we've done in the last 20 years is just not going to be adequate to the scale of the challenge we're going to present in Asia with the empowerment of China, by Russians uh, at this juncture. On the economic side, we've talked about resilient supply chains, but I think we need to do a lot more to bring our you know, economic cooperation much closer, work with Australia. I don't know why the state of India-Japan economic relations is not great, but if India is going to negotiate free trade agreements with, uh, with Australia, with Britain, uh, why aren't we talking about something, India-Japan doing something similar because uh, the pressure from China on the economic front too is, is going to grow. So, so I would say, uh, the structural change, I think we're not doing enough to see the change that is unfolding, even as we speak today, which uh, divides once again uh, Europe between Russia and the West. And every time that has happened, that has worked in China's favor historically, 
And in the 70s, 50 years ago, when Nixon went to Beijing, he tried to play China against Russia. But today, once again, China becomes the critical player. And that puts both India and Japan at a serious disadvantage. And we need to have ways to correct that quickly, decisively, and boldly. Thank you, Raj, uh, for that masterly wrap. Um, I think Tokuchi san wanted a quick intervention. So, Tokuchi san you have very little time, but so go right ahead. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'd, actually, I'd like to uh, add a few uh, points uh, about uh, Japan India uh, security cooperation. Uh, first, uh, India-Japan uh, maritime uh, security cooperation about HADR, particularly in Southeast Asia. Uh, due to climate change, uh, natural disasters are becoming more powerful. Uh, so I do believe that uh, military uh, cooperative efforts for adaptation and uh, response to the impact of climate change uh, should be uh, promoted, particularly in uh, capacity building support for uh, Southeast Asians. And the second, uh, Japan, uh, the government of Japan is uh, reviewing uh, its national security strategy, international security cooperation with uh, regional and extra regional uh, partners will continue to be one of the pillars. And security partnership with India is placed uh, uh, next to the US, South Korea, uh, Australia, ASEAN countries, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, US, South Korea, Australia, and ASEAN countries in the present uh, security strategy document. Uh, but uh, it is different, uh, definitely certain that the priority of India uh, will be uh, much higher. So uh, I think uh, it will be a desirable development if realized, but uh, we must not be complacent. Uh, it is more important to put the uh, priority into action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tokuchi san. Uh, I, it, I will have to bring this uh, uh, session to a close. Thank you for such fantastic comments. And I'm so glad that we are speaking on a day when uh, we are actually watching uh, the world in a churn, which, which puts much, much greater pressure on all of us to look at this in that it is very, very important partnership uh, and tweak it um, going forward to uh, be able to address the, uh, the challenges that we can see unfolding in front of our very eyes. We have, we've had a fantastic session today. Um, the 70 years uh, uh, celebrations of diplomatic relations, we, I, I think kicked off in a wonderful way because we have, today's conference has put the issues on the table in a way that is both realistic and future, uh, future heavy. Um, we have a rich past. We have a rich history that we share between the two countries. It is, it is for all of us to um, take this forward to a new relationship. Um, that is not only defined by um, our history, but, is but should be defined by uh, the current challenges that we face. For the last two years, the, the world has faced the cha challenge of a pandemic, which has changed global politics completely, which has changed global partnerships and relationships. What we are seeing unfolding before us this, from this morning will change it all even further. And it, I think it behoves all of us to uh, work much, much closer together uh, to keep not just this vital partnership going, but to anchor this vital partnership as the key relationship in keeping a free and, Indo and open Indo-Pacific uh, going. Thank you all very much. Uh, and participants, not just from this session, but from every session from the morning, and uh, uh, thank you for, for being here. I think uh, Kiran is back. Uh, maybe Kiran, would, would you like to say the last word, Kiran? Sure, thank you, Indrani. But uh, the last word should have been yours. Um, so thanks to all our speakers today. It's been fabulous to have such an outstanding uh, group with us. Uh, lots of uh, action items have come out. 
uh, we hope to get a document together with the and start working on it and start sharing it so that others can start working on it. And we have a great, great outcome of this conference. So let's keep celebrating for the rest of the year. It's a special year. And um, a big thank you to both our ambassadors, especially for being with us and for uh, just running and leading the way for this wonderful relationship. Thank you all. Thank you, Indrani. Thank you very much. My, my, my thanks go to Kiran for your dedicated service for many years. And my thanks also go to Indrani and uh, wish you best in your new capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Tom. Really appreciate Thank that. Thank you very much. Yeah.